So hey guys, how are you all? Welcome to Muse Fanfiction. So we are back with a brand new movie on what if Naruto inherited the combined power of Jinchurikis but before we start, be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Now let's begin the story. Naruto and Jiraiya stood before Tsunade, the blonde Hokage finishing some paperwork, signing her approval with a flourish of her pen. Shuffling the papers slightly then picking them up and tapping them against the wood of the desk to straighten them out, Tsunade handed the packet to Shizune for filing or delivery. Once Shizune had departed, Tsunade settled her gaze on the two ninja, causing both to straighten into parade attention. Tsunade flipped a hand at the duo, a signal for them to relax. Jiraiya settled into a not-so-subtle leer at Tsunade's bosom as the briefing began. Afternoon Naruto, Tsunade began. How do you feel? Naruto absently rubbed the scar on the left side of his chest, all which was left of the bullet wound that Tenten had given him at the Valley of the End. Better, I don't have any problem with the shortness of breath anymore. My burns have completely healed, and the needles around my heart are gone too. Very good, Tsunade replied, nodding in a satisfied manner. Well then, I think that you are completely recovered and ready to return to active duty. That was the best news that Naruto had heard in a long time. Having to endure two weeks of forced inactivity had left him irritable and short-tempered, even with Hanada and Tenten. So when Tsunade said he could finally return to active duty, happiness was a weak adjective to describe the emotion he felt. He trembled for a few seconds before he thrust a fist towards the ceiling followed by the rest of him. His cry of, Yada, was cut off mid-syllable by Jiraiya's fist meeting the crown of his head. No need to get so excitable brat, Jiraiya growled, Naruto's exclamation giving new fuel to his hangover. Once Naruto shook the swirls from his eyes, he stood up and after glaring at Jiraiya he refocused on Tsunade. So why did you call me up here granny? You could have told me in the hospital without this guy here. Very true. The real reason why I have called you here is because I am assigning you an A-rank mission. Naruto, with your mother's permission, I am officially apprenticing you to Jiraiya. You will be accompanying Jiraiya on his travels for the next two to three years. As you are well aware, the organization of Nuke Nin calling themselves Akatsuki is after you. While you remain in Konoha, they can be sure where you are, and that makes you vulnerable. And that is absolutely unacceptable. With Jiraiya, you will have his undivided attention to train and protect you. Protect. I don't need protection. The sharp crack of Tsunade's meaty palm coming into contact with the desk cut him off. Wrong Naruto. You have at least two possibly as many as 9s rank criminals after your head. I do not mean to insult you, but were you in the bingo book you would have a B ranking at best. Against the kind of ninja that Akatsuki is made of, you stand no chance. What about my team? Hanada and Tenten will remain here in Konoha. They will probably be split up to fill holes in other genin teams until you return. As soon as the words were out of her mouth Tenten and Hanada were through the door, a flustered Shizune hot on their heels. I'm sorry Tsunade-sama, I tried to keep them out but they wouldn't listen. Tsunade silenced her apprentice with a curt look and focused on the two intruding Kunoichi. Good afternoon Tenten-san, Hanada-san. What, may I ask, do you need that is so important that it necessitates interrupting an A-rank mission briefing? Hokage-sama, forgive us for interrupting, Hanada began, slightly out of breath, but we request to be added to the mission roster. And why would I do that? You are just Genin. You are not qualified to be added to an A-rank mission. At this, Hanada stumbled. She couldn't say that the reason she and Tenten had was that they did not want to be separated from Naruto for several years. Glancing sideways to Tenten, Hanada hoped that Tenten had come up with something better than, because we would miss him. Tenten unfortunately looked as uncertain as she did. But as both girls looked at one another, Trying to come up with anything that sounded like a remotely legitimate reason, Jiraiya, spoke. I wouldn't mind letting them come along. I can teach three genin just as ably as one. Tsunade said nothing for several long seconds, staring her ninja. Oh come on Tsunade Haim. You don't need a pair of genin that badly, and they can learn more from me than anyone else here, unless you are planning to take them under your wing. And it isn't like an extra pair of genin would make things that much more dangerous. All right you two, I assume that you were listening to the whole briefing. Yes, well I hope that you are sure. 
there are at least two S rank nuke nin, probably as many as nine, after him. Were either of you two to stand between Naruto and Akatsuki, they would have no compunction against killing you. You mean they would treat us like any other enemy combatant? Tenten asked. Tsunade opened her mouth to reply, but said nothing, unable to refute Tenten's logic. Yes, they would treat you like an enemy combatant. Just as long as you are cognizant of the danger. They nodded in unison. Far be it from me to deny true love. Well, Jiraiya, looks like you just got yourself a team. But if any of the characters in your next novel bear anything more than a passing resemblance to any of those three kids, I will be looking for a new spymaster. Long since having been inoculated against Tsunade's threats, Jiraiya's smile barely faltered. Shizune, add Higurashi Tenten and Hayuga Hinata to the roster as well. Shizune, who had been standing in the doorway during the discussion, voiced an affirmative and ducked out the doorway. When do you want to leave? Jiraiya thought about it for a few seconds. I am sure that the kids will want some time to say goodbye, so tomorrow, I think. That should give me some time to finish up one or two things I need to tie up here as well. Nothing to do with my research, he assured the volatile Hokage. All right then, dismissed, saluting, the five ninja about turned and left her office. The group stopped outside the main doors of the tower and split up, Naruto and his teammates going home to start packing. Ooh, Tenten did not have many possessions, so it took her and Naruto less than an hour to pack all her stuff. Naruto had left to run a few errands, or so he said, so she had been left to her own devices for the time being. She left her apartment, locked the door behind her and started walking. It felt strange, to be leaving for so long. It was just two weeks shy of one full year since they had graduated the academy and become fully-fledged Konoha Shinobi. If everything went according to plan, by the time she and her team returned, they would have been out of Konoha for longer than they had officially been ninja. She was still a little incredulous that the Hokage had caved into her and Hinata's request so easily. She had gone in fully expecting to have to fight tooth and nail for her and Hinata to be included in the mission. So when Tsunade acquiesced almost without any argument at all, she was surprised to say the least. Still, she wasn't one to look a gift horse in the mouth. She was just glad to be going with Naruto and not be left behind. As she walked, she noted teams of Naruto clones working on the reconstruction. It had been a little over a month since the invasion and the reconstruction was only now really getting going, although it was hastened quite a bit with 2000 odd extra helpers. Most shinobi were out assisting, including the genin cells that were still taking missions. She and Hinata had been exempt from helping out, for the most part, since Naruto, the nominal leader of their team, had been put on bed rest, and that meant no training or physical labor. Of course, Naruto wasn't one for following rules when he could get away from it, hence the Shadow Clone Reconstruction Force. Arriving at her destination, she opened the door, the familiar jingle of the bell sounding in her ears. The Higurashi weapon shop looked exactly the same as she remembered it, taking mostly superficial damage during the invasion. Mom, Dad, anyone here? Tenten heard feet pounding on the second floor, and then on the stairs. Tenten Chan, Chi Chi crouched down to look at Tenten from between the bars of the banister before hurrying all the way down. How are you? Are you okay? Yeah mom, I'm fine. Is dad around? I need to talk to you two about something. Yeah. He is a Kowski. It's Tenten. Kowski emerged from the back room a few seconds later, wiping his hands on an already dirty cloth. Tenten Chan, how are you? I'm fine, Dad. I just wanted to come over to let you know that I have been assigned a long term mission, A rank. How long term? At least two years, maybe longer. Kowski and Chi Chi knew better than to ask for details about the mission. Had either one of them been Shinobi, Tenten would have been able to be more forthcoming, but civilians were not issued security clearances. Do you know when you have to leave? Kowski asked the only question that Tenten would be able to answer. Tomorrow. Do you need any equipment? Kanai, shuriken, wire, oil, whetstones. Tenten nodded her head. Dad, can I get the molds you made for my ammunition and whatever gunpowder you have left? Sure thing Tenten Chan. Do you need any ammunition made now? No, I still have most of the last batch I made before the invasion. I just need the molds and gunpowder so I can make more when I need to. What about a forge? 
Most towns have a smithy in them. I can rent one out when I need to. If I can't, it isn't like it would be hard to make a temporary forge somewhere else. It isn't like I need a full smithy. All right then, you sure that is all you need? Yes, I'm sure. Do you want your stuff sealed or just packed away? Seal it up please. Okay, be right back. Chi Chi shifted uncomfortably once Kowski had left, mirrored by Tenton. Hard words had been said, the last time they had spoken, and neither one knew how to take back what had been said. Silence reigned unbroken until Kowski returned. Tenton took the proffered scroll and was pulled into a hug by her father when she did. Be safe Tenton Chan, write us when you can, please. When I can, Tenton agreed. Good, we love you. Kowski finally released his only daughter, and the three stood in awkward silence until Tenton gave a jerky farewell and left. You didn't say anything to her. No, Chi Chi muttered, I don't know what to say to make her listen. She is an adult now, Kowski reminded Chi Chi. Hardly, she is thirteen. She is a shinobi, you can't judge her solely by her age anymore. The last few months alone prove that. Thirteen is too young for marriage, no matter what. You are going to have to accept that Tenten makes her own decisions now Chi Chi Chan. She has her own life that has nothing to do with us anymore. There are some lessons that she has to learn for herself, and this is one of them. I just don't want her to regret anything. That boy is tricking her, I know it. If he is, then she will figure it out sooner or later. I would rather she not have to figure it out at all. I know, Chi Chi Chan. I don't want her to get hurt either, but in her profession, it will be unavoidable. I still don't understand why you let her attend the Shinobi Academy in the first place. Kowski sighed. It is in her blood. I don't think that she would have ever been truly happy otherwise. She would have been happy enough, Chi Chi replied. Turning away, she returned upstairs before Kowski could say anything else. Shaking his head, Kowski returned to the back room, the oddness of the conversation making him chuckle. It was remarkable how their positions had reversed, his and his wife's. When Tenten had fist graduated, he had been the one opposed to Tenten interacting with Naruto. Now he was defending her decision to accept Naruto's proposal. What differences time could make? Ooh, Hanada been home for twenty minutes when a senior branch Hayuga knelt in the doorway to their suite, he had to clear his throat three times to gain the pair's attention. Naruto looked at the pair of branch servants for a moment when their motions slowed to a halt, then looked to the sitting room. Knocking on the end of the open door to get Hanada's attention, Naruto jerked his head back to where the other Hayuga knelt in the doorway. How much you wanna bet that is your dad wanting to talk about the mission? Naruto had long since given up his speculation as to how the hell Hiyashi seemed to know as much as the Hokage almost as quickly. Hanada looked back over her shoulder to where the servant knelt, waiting to address them. Leaning forward over the large luggage scroll, she knelt beside, she placed her hands on the circular ceiling array inscribed before her twisted her hands slightly as she channeled the requisite chakra to her hands and watched as the bundle of clothes vanished in a puff of smoke. Rocking forward slightly, she pushed off her knees and stood up. Naruto stayed in the doorway as Hanada approached the servant. Hanada-sama, your father requests you're in Naruto-sama's presence in his chambers, post haste. Told you, Naruto muttered as they were escorted from their suite to Hiyashi's outermost chamber. The servant and opened the sliding door front he pair, and then closed it behind them. The servant remained by the first door as the pair moved across the room. When everyone was properly seated Hiyashi tucked the sheaf of paper he was perusing into a drawer. Studying Naruto and Hinata for a few interminable seconds, Hiyashi broke the silence in his usual manner when dealing with subordinates. That is to say, abruptly and without preamble. I am most concerned about the A-rank mission that the Hokage has assigned your squad Naruto-kun. I understand the reasoning behind your assignment. As Jiraiya-sama's apprentice and a Jinchiriki, it would be foolhardy for you to remain in Konoha. However, Hanada's inclusion is troublesome. As a possessor of an unsealed Byakugan, your well-being is a concern. I can see no legitimate reason for you to be assigned to this mission. Well, Naruto replied in a smug manner, glad for an opportunity to one-up Hiyashi, that is not a decision for you to make. The Hokage saw fit to put her on the mission, so that should be good enough for you. They might have been allies of a sort, but they were far from friendly. 
Hiyashi's flinty stare would have intimidated Naruto once, but not anymore. What I am wondering is exactly why my daughter and your other, teammate, have been included. Neither of them has been apprenticed to Jiraiya-sama, and while I do not doubt that Hinata-chan could benefit from his instruction, Jiraiya has not taken a student on in close to 20 years, not since your biological father. So forgive me if I fail to see why he would be amenable to taking a whole genin cell on now. I guess he was feeling nostalgic, Naruto replied. It was his idea to include Hinata-chan and Tenten-chan. Hiyashi studied Naruto's too wide smile for a few seconds while Hinata whispered at him furiously and Naruto made soothing noises back. Liar! Hiyashi proclaimed while Naruto continued to smile. You're right, Naruto conceded without missing a beat. But the reason why Hinata was included is immaterial. The only thing that matters is that she was included, by the Hokage no less and that should be enough for you. You should know now that I love Hinata-chan unconditionally, and I would do everything in my power to keep her safe. So you can stop worrying about her unsecured Byakugan because the only way anyone is getting their hands on her Byakugan is if I am dead. And as I have proven, I am not easy to kill. Besides, Hinata is no pushover herself. And we will have Aero Senen with us too, so it is not like she will be without protection. Be that as it may, as powerful as Jiraiya is, he is only one man. And even Jiraiya can be defeated or even killed. However true that may be, the fact is that the Hokage personally put Hinata on this mission. But before you go to Granny Tsunade to complain, I would keep in mind that she is not the old man. Is there anything else you want to discuss, because Hinata and I need to keep packing? Hiyashi gave Naruto a sharp look before answering. Actually, yes, there is. Pulling a scroll about as long as Hinata's arm and only slightly thicker out from a drawer in his desk he handed the scroll to his daughter. Hinata gasped eyes wide as saucers when she held the scroll. F.A. Father, you, is this, I mean, it exists. They do. That is a copy I had made for you recently. Open it up and look inside. Gently setting the scroll on the desk, she carefully unfurled the scroll. Quickly activating her Byakugan, she scanned the first part of the scroll. Peering over Hinata's shoulder, Naruto scrunched his face in confusion. I don't get it, the scroll is blank. To the eyes of normal humans, it would be. But to the enlightened eyes of a Hyuga, that scroll filled with the deadliest hand-to-hand -hand combat techniques in the world. What, are they some super secret Jukan moves? Of a sort, Hinata replied absently. There are three levels of the Jukan commonly taught, the first two to all Hyuga and the third reserved for the main branch. There is a quasi-mythical fourth tier that allows the user to kill with a single touch. This scroll has the nine forms of the Dim Mok, the Fist of Death, written down. Supposedly, the final form, the Soul Death, allows the user to rip the soul out of a living person with their bare hands. But I thought you could already do that with the normal Jukan. Contrary to popular belief, the Jukan is a fairly non-lethal taijutsu style, with only a handful of killing techniques. The Jukan can be used to kill, like all martial arts, but it is mostly centered on dealing temporary disabling damage, rather than lethal damage. Uh, okay, I guess. Hanada sighed. To put it simply, by and large, the Jukan does not kill. The Dim Mok, however, does nothing but kill. Well, I guess that makes sense. Being called the Fist of Death and all. A moment after Naruto stopped speaking, Hinata's eyes leapt to her father. Do I know it? Hiyashi asked before Hinata said anything. No, I don't. The dim mock is something that was taught to the first Hyuga by the Shinigami himself, or so the legend goes. But it was deemed too dangerous and was eventually forgotten by most. I had a feeling that something was going to happen soon, and had this made. I cannot say why, but I believe that you will have need of this before too long. Hurriedly rolling the scroll back up, Hinata stood and bowed to Hiyashi before scurrying out the door. Well then, if there is nothing else, I think I will take my leave as well. Nodding to Hiyashi, he had almost made it out the door before the Hyuga patron spoke again. Be careful, Naruto-san. There is a storm gathering on the horizon, and I believe that you will be at its center. Thanks for the warning, he replied seriously, and left. Ooh. Naruto found Hinata sitting on the futon staring at the scroll on her hands. I can't believe my father gave me this, Hinata said when Naruto sat down next to her. Sounds pretty amazing, 
doesn't it? Yeah, it kinda does. Every Hyuga grows up on stories about the Dim Mach. The fighting style that uses the power of the Shinigami itself. I mean, I never actually thought it existed. Well it does, and you have the proof right in your hands. Hanada didn't respond for a few seconds so Naruto took her chin in his fingers and turned her face so he could kiss her on the lips. Hanada closed her eyes and leaned into the kiss. When Naruto pulled back a few seconds later, Hanada hugged him, resting her head on his chest. Sorry about that, nah, it's fine, must be pretty unbelievable, you okay now? Yeah, I'm just glad that he had this when you asked. My father does not like challenges to his authority. I am sure that my father will do something to pay you back for being so rude to him, even in private. Naruto grinned, maybe so, but we are leaving tomorrow for at least two years, so whatever he plans will be put on hold until at least then, assuming he can hold a grudge over something that minor that long. And that is something I can deal with. And it isn't like I can't take care of myself. I know you can, but that doesn't stop me from worrying. A light laugh came from Naruto's lips at that. And that is just one more reason I love you. Hanada giggled and gave him a peck on the lips. Pushing herself to her feet, she went into Naruto's room, Naruto following her, leaning on the doorjam and crossed his arms over his chest as Hanada unrolled the large luggage scroll. Don't trust me to pack enough underwear. Hanada gave him a look over her shoulder that said exactly that. Come on Hanada-chan, stop worrying about the mission, Naruto whispered in her ear from behind. There will be time enough for that later. Anyways, it's almost dinner time, and I'm hungry. Feel like going out. Hanada rolled her eyes. Let me guess, Ichiraku's. Naruto shrugged, as if to say, what can I do? Well, we are leaving for the next couple of years soon. And we haven't been there in forever. We were there Sunday, and it is Wednesday. Two days is the next best thing to forever. Sighing, Hanada gave in. Naruto pumped a fist low and hissed out a, yes, drawing out the, s, sound. Grabbing his Gama-chan wallet from the dresser, one of only a handful of things left that had not been packed away and slipping the baldric to his Zanpakuto off the peg by the door, they left. Practically skipping as he held her hand on the way to his favorite restaurant, the only thought in his mind was which flavor of ramen to order first. Holding the privacy flaps to one side and letting Hinata enter first like a proper gentleman he gave a cheery hello to the elderly proprietor of the best ramen bar in the world. Good evening Naruto-kun, Hanada-sama. Eating here or to go? Eating in tonight ayame ne chan All right then, what can I do for you tonight? Naruto didn't even bother to look at the menu printed on the large board hanging behind and above Ayame's head before ordering. I will start off with a Hokage-sized beef ramen, then a miso, chicken shrimp and finish off with a Konoha Supreme. What about you Hanada-sama? Medium chicken ramen, please. All right then, one Hokage beef, one medium chicken coming right up. Hanada and Naruto waited in comfortable silence as they waited for their meal to arrive. Ayame had gone to the rear to give her father their order and there was no one else in the bar at the moment, so the silence was unbroken, except for the ambient sounds of the foot traffic filtering in from outside. Three minutes later, an elderly man with a spotted white apron and spotless white cap approached the counter, two steaming bowls in hand. Setting the food down on the counter in front of his customers, he pulled a pair of chopsticks from a pocket in his apron and set them across the downs. Ichiraku Chuki let Naruto and Hinata break the chopsticks apart, give thanks and eat a few bites before saying anything. How have you been Naruto? Been a while since I have seen you. Fine. Been busy. What with finding Tsunade and helping out with the reconstruction and all. At least until tomorrow. What happens tomorrow? Long term mission. How long term? Two or three years, not really sure. Ayame wanted to ask more, but knew better. Naruto would tell them all he was allowed to, and not a word more. Gonna be spending it with Aero Senen, training. Your whole team. Yeah, mom got sent off to the capital, so the pervert is taking her place. That is quite an honor. Mixed blessing. When he and I went looking for Tsunade, he stole my money and spent most of it whoring and drinking. I will spend as much time trying to get him to train me as actually training, if not more. He is strong, no doubt about it, but he is a bum the rest of the time. Chuki and Ayame looked shocked that Naruto would speak like that about one of the legendary three. 
Hanada just shrugged when they looked to her. It's true, for the most part. When he isn't drinking, he is peeping, when he isn't peeping he's, in the red light district, she euphemized, unable to bring herself to actually say, whoring. He is the author of Ika Ika, after all. Don't worry though, I have developed several techniques to combat his lazy lecherousness. Sides, if he ever tried to peep on either of my girls, I would pound him into next week, after they finished with him. The rest of the meal was spent in silence as Naruto and Hinata finished their meal. Naruto told Chuki when they were leaving the next day so they could see Team 9 off. Ooh, the silence was unbroken in the deserted academy, classes having dismissed for the day, the only people still in the building were the teachers themselves. The silence was only emphasized by the soft, almost undetectable whispering of Hinata and Tenten's sandals and Naruto's getta. Opening the door to Aruka's classroom, Naruto walked in. Hello Naruto-kun, Tenten-chan, Hinata-sama. Afternoon sensei, Naruto replied. What are you doing right now? Grading papers. Aruka set his pen down and leaned back in his chair. Need something? No, just wanted to come by to talk to you, that okay? Yeah, I can spare a few minutes for my worst student. Hey, I will have you know that it was all an act. All of it, well, almost all of it, now that I could believe. Whatever, I am the Lightning Legion, what use have I of silly school grades? Well, had your mother not taught you the Shadow Clone technique, you would have had a lot of use for them because you need them to graduate. Grades are for people who don't have my built-in awesomeness to rely on. Uruka rolled his eyes. You are a fluke Naruto. A one in a million happenstance. Never happened before, never will happen again. You graduated because of the Kyubi. Had it not been for the Kyubi, I would have passed with flying colors. Not even the Nine Tails has enough anti-awesome to counter mine. There are so many flaws in that argument I don't even know where to start. You don't know where to start because there are no flaws. Uruka facepalmed. There is just no winning with you as there. Nope. Naruto couldn't have been prouder. But his smile slid off his face as quickly as it had arrived. But there was something that I wanted to talk to you about Uruka sensei I'm listening. Well, two things actually. The first is we are going to be leaving soon, for the next couple of years. I finally got officially apprenticed to Aero Senen, and we are going to be leaving Konoha with him for training. Tenten Chan and Hinata Sama too. Yep, all three of us. Well that is interesting. Been a while since he has taken a student, let alone three. I know. That kind of ties into the second reason I wanted to talk to you. Have you ever heard of an organization called Akatsuki? No, can't say I have. We don't know much about them, but what we do know we are pretty sure of. There are nine members, each S rank missing Nin. They have been operating as a mercenary force, bounty hunting and hiring themselves out as fighters. But most importantly, they seem to be after the Jinchuriki, or more specifically, the Biju. That, that is bad. Yeah, no kidding, they have some pretty hardcore members too. I ran into Itachi clan killer and the monster of the mist, Hoshigaki Kisame. Uruka paled under his tan, and you made it out alive. I wouldn't have, had it not been for Jiraiya. They fled pretty quickly after he turned up. Yeah, I would imagine. In any case, they blew their hand. Apparently, Senen has known about them for a while now, and while he won't tell me who his source is, he told me that they were not supposed to start making moves on the Jinchuriki for another two years, at least. I think that we somehow managed to stumble on them while they were in the middle of a job and they decided to take a swing at me and missed. That, is pretty scary Naruto. Tell me about it, Naruto said, grimacing. I was pretty damned lucky that Jiraiya happened to walk in on them as they made their move. Had Aero Senen been two minutes later, I would have been gone. In any case I have been thinking about Akatsuki a lot lately, and how they are planning on gathering all the biju. I want to use you as a sounding board for an idea of mine. Really, a barely trained, rookie chunin like you has a plan on how to deal with 9s rank criminals. This ought to be interesting. Everyone looked up to where Jiraiya was hanging upside down, looking in through one of the opened windows. How long have you been there? Naruto demanded, from the beginning more or less. Jiraiya swung down through the window and leaned on the sill. I got bored so I decided to follow you three around. 
You do tend to get into interesting situations when I am not around. Whatever. Anyways, as I was saying, whatever Akatsuki wants with the Biju, it is bad. I want to go to the other Jinchuriki and we form our own organization, one to counter them. I already know the Sandys host pretty well. We teamed up during the second stage of the Chunin exams and we both passed. I think she would be willing to at least hear me out on this. I don't know how much resistance I could run into with the others, but with Sora's agreement, I think it is possible to at least get everyone to meet. Worst comes to worst, at least they will be warned. The silence stretched for what seemed to be an eternity as the others tried to wrap their brains around what Naruto was suggesting. Naruto, Uruka began in carefully measured tones, but cut himself off when Jiraiya leaned forward. Naruto, Jiraiya began again, what you are saying you want to do is, monumental. I don't think you realize exactly what you are undertaking here, what an effort this Jinchuriki alliance would be. And there are any number of problems with the concept itself. First of all, were you to succeed with your plan, you would have accomplished what a century of negotiations would have failed to do. The treaty standing between the five elemental countries is little more than a simple non-aggression pact, and that is barely worth the paper it is on. There is no mutual defense clause if someone were to attack, and no way to embargo another country. Second, I don't think you realize how little freedom most Jinchuriki have. The Jinchuriki are the ultimate weapons, the ace in the hole for any country that has won. Their movement is carefully monitored, every step outside their home village scrutinized. At the end of the last war, there are agreements as strong as laws made forbidding another country to send its Jinchuriki into another Jinchuriki possessing nation. You would have to go to the daimyo and receive permission to even approach one of the other Jinchuriki possessing nations. What about the mission to Karigakar? I was on that mission. Jiraiya sighed, already knowing that this was going to be a headache. That is because your team was requested specifically. They can do that, to a certain extent, Uruka replied. Any client requesting a specific individual or team is subjected to intense scrutiny. I don't have to tell you that we shinobi make enemies all the time, so when someone wants a particular person sent, we have to make sure that it is not an ambush. Okay, but that does not explain the mission to Kiri. How could we have been requested when they did not know we were coming? Serutobi and the Mizukage had been in contact prior to your mission, and you were sent to deliver the formal invitation. So the mission was a sham. No Naruto, your mission served a purpose, even if you cannot understand it right now. In any case, we seem to have drifted from our original subject. Drop it Naruto, Jiraiya told the Chunin when it looked like he was going to protest. In any case, I hope that you appreciate the amount of work that this is going to entail. If you are serious about this, then I will support you when you go to Tsunade. I am. Akatsuki has already tried to take me once. I don't know what they want with us, but whatever it is, I doubt that it will be anything good. The fact that they want the Biju is grounds enough to want to stop them. You said it yourself Jiraiya Sensei. We Jinchuriki are the ultimate weapons. The time is coming for Akatsuki to learn just what that means. Jiraiya smiled at the determination in Naruto's expression. And I wouldn't expect anything less from my student. Assuming that Tsunade allows you to go forward with your plan. The first thing we will need to do is get the diplomatic and traveling papers you are going to need. I have contacts within the daimyo's court and your marriage to Hinata should make that somewhat easier. Hinata brightened when she realized what Jiraiya was talking about. All senior members of the bloodline clans in Konoha are automatically granted a lordship equivalent to a royal minister when they come of age. Exactly, Jiraiya said, otherwise you would have to be established at court first. Well, at least my marriage has finally done some good. Naruto winced as soon as the words were out of his mouth, raising his hands defensively and turning to Hinata to apologize. Hinata silenced him by putting a finger to his lips and offering a small smile. Relax Naruto-kun, I know what you meant. Naruto took her hands in his and kissed her knuckles before turning to Jiraiya. So where do we start? Ooh. The group waited with bated breath an hour later as Tsunade leaned back in her chair behind her expansive desk, fingers steepled as she considered Naruto's absurd idea. After almost two full minutes of silence, the Hokage swiveled around to face Naruto and spoke. Naruto, as altruistic as your plan is, there are some things that I must know before I can okay this. First, 
Do you have any idea as to where your organization will be based? Before Naruto could speak, Jiraiya answered. As you know the Land of Iron is the only truly neutral country, having served for the location for any number of shinobi summits in the past. I know the man who leads it, a man named Mifune. As you know, the Land of Iron has suffered in the past at the hands of ninja, both during the secret wars and during peacetime. I am sure he would support any initiative that would increase goodwill among the elemental countries. Assuming we can get this past the daimyo, that will be one of the first stops we will make. Okay, I can accept that for now. What kind of leadership is there going to be? Who will be in charge of this group? And what about funds? Honestly, at this point, I can't say. Right now, all I am aiming for is for getting everyone to just meet. Everything else can be worked out once I get everyone to sit at the same table. Tsunade considered what he said for a few seconds before responding. All right Naruto, I will back you on this, with conditions. First I want oversight, any action your group takes has to be approved by me. Second, I want someone there to represent Konoha. Third, any intelligence you receive is passed straight on to me. Lastly, any charter your group adopts must have a clause preventing any member of your group from gaining access to any material or intelligence resources within Konoha. Naruto was shaking his head before Tsunade had finished. Your first two conditions are unacceptable. I trust you granny, but I am not going to risk having my group fall under the council's influence. If that were to happen, that would be the end of anything I try to do. You know the council would have absolutely no qualms about doing whatever they think is necessary to gain an edge over another country. As for your second condition, Konoha can have a representative, but only in a strictly observatory role. The only reason my plan has a wisp of a chance of success is because me and my fellow Jinchuriki are Jinchuriki, and have a vested interest in seeing Akatsuki eradicated. I am not going to see my group hijacked and destroyed to further some politician's agenda. The only people, and I mean only, who will have any say in anything my group does are those directly involved. I will share any intelligence I receive with you as a matter of course, but I will not go hunting for secrets for you. Several seconds passed as Naruto and Tsunade matched wills. Suddenly, Tsunade leaned back and grinned. The sudden change in demeanor seemed to throw Naruto for a moment. Good Naruto, I hope that you would object to my conditions. If you could not stand up to me, I would have withdrawn my support. To make this idea of yours work, you are going to have to stand up against a lot of powerful people, people who are going to want to use you to fulfill their agendas. Be sure to keep in contact. I will try to help as much as I can. Let me know if you ever need anything. People, material, funds, I will do what I can for you. Naruto offered a grin to match hers. Thanks a lot granny, you don't know what it means to me. Yeah, yeah. Now get the hell out of my office before I start crying. Showing teeth, Naruto led the exodus from Tsunade's office and out onto the street. Naruto turned to the group and spread his arms in an expansive gesture, taking in everyone in front of him. So how about a celebration for getting my plan approved? Uruka opened his mouth to agree, but Jiraiya cut across his words. Sorry, but we can't. We grown-ups have to discuss some things about your upcoming mission. Before Uruka could disagree, Jiraiya clamped his hand down on Uruka's shoulder and vanished in a body flicker. The three teens looked at one another uncertainly, blinking in surprise at the hasty exit. Well, that was weird, even for Aero Senen. As one, Hanada and Tenten agreed. As it seems we have some time alone, what do you want to do? Grinning mischievously, the two women grabbed Naruto's arms and jumped to the roofs. The first night after leaving Konoha, after camp had been made and dinner eaten, Jiraiya gathered them in front of the fire. All right, as I am sure you are well aware, our first stop is going to be the fire capital there are many things you three must know before approaching the daimyo. How much do you three know about how the government works outside of Konoha? Naruto and Tenten gave Jiraiya matching blank looks. Hanada raised her hand, waiting for Jiraiya to wave a hand in her direction for permission to speak. Well, as everyone knows, the daimyo is the head of government, but the national military runs just about everything outside of the self-governance zone, and the military is dominated by the nobly born samurai. Wait, self-governance zone? What is that? Did you even attend a single social studies class Naruto-kun? Tenten asked. Not when I could avoid it. 
and I pretty much slept through what classes I did attend. Still, you should have at least heard of the self-governance zone. Nope, Jiraiya knew how thick-headed Naruto could be, but there were some gaps in his knowledge that just boggled the mind. I mean, I paid attention in most classes, even if I didn't look like it, but math and social studies were the two classes that always put me to sleep for real. Jiraiya was pinching the bridge of his nose, trying to keep his calm. Hanada-chan, if you please. Basically, what you need to know is that when Konoha was founded, the Shodai Hokage got the fire daimyo to create a self-governance zone around Konoha. As long as we do not work against the interests of the fire country, we are pretty much left to our own devices. Inside the SGZ, just about everything but the issuance of currency is under the Hokage's purview. That includes taxation, policing, public works, infrastructure and the like. The daimyo has the authority to issue command directives to the Hokage and not much else. So what does that mean? Essentially, we do missions for the daimyo for free whenever he needs us to and in return we control everything except the printing of money. Exactly, Jiraiya continued. Now, obviously given the size of the national military, it is run differently from the hidden villages, both in organization and scale. Under the shinobi system, where there are a relative handful compared to the national military, there are five official ranks, Genin, Chunin, Tokubetsu Junin, Junin and village leader. The national army is hundreds of times bigger than the shinobi corps are, so they have more ranks than we do. There are two basic types of personnel, enlisted and officers. There are a few subdivisions, but all you really need to know are the basics. The seven enlisted ranks are Buck Private, Private First Class, Lance Corporal, Corporal, Sergeant, Sergeant Major, Command Sergeant Major. The nine officer ranks are Warrant Officer, Lieutenant, Captain, Major, Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel, Lieutenant General, Major General and General of the Army. Now, as ninja have to interact with the National Army on occasion, and by extension the samurai, all shinobi hold honorary ranks in the army, based on our shinobi rank. Genin start out at command sergeant major, chunin at captain, junin at colonel and cages at general of the army. Tsunade and I hold a rank of lieutenant general because of our special status as sanin. What about tokubetsu junin? Tenten asked. Well, as you know, tokubetsu junin are ninja that have junin level skill in one area. In the shinobi system, that places them between Chunin and Junin. But the army's system works slightly differently. The equivalent of a Tokubetsu Junin are warrant officers, who are the technical experts who have specialized knowledge in a single field. So, Tokubetsu Junin are lower ranked in the national military than in Konoha. Not exactly Naruto. Warrant officers are kind of to the side of the rest. Warrant officers start off between command sergeant major and lieutenant but they can hold commands equivalent to and in special cases over commissioned officers. Now, as Hanada-san already said, the samurai run just about everything outside of Konoha. Did Anko ever tell you about the tripod of power supporting the fire country? Samurai beats ninja, ninja beats monk, monk beats samurai. Ah, well that is one way of putting it, I suppose. Oversimplified, but accurate more or less. Naruto just grinned. In any case, it is the samurai who pretty much run the entire national military. Beyond the enlisted officer division, you also have a commoner noble split in the military. At the lower levels, you have commoners vastly outnumbering the nobles, but the balance tips farther toward the nobles the higher up the command chain you go. For example, you would never find a samurai below the rank of lieutenant, barring special cases. On the other hand, there is only one commoner who has been promoted to general officer in the last 10 to 15 years or so. As you can probably guess, the samurai live up to their reputation of formality and rigid organization. Shinobi are the antithesis of samurai in every sense of the word, so we are not quite persona non grata in the capital, we are far from their favorite people. And that brings me to my next point. Remember those three scrolls Tsunade gave you. Open them up. When the trio did, they saw a set of blue uniforms in front of them. Picking the coat up, Naruto examined it. Are we going to be wearing these in the capital? The uniforms were made of neutral blue cotton. The pants had two front pockets and a thin red stripe running down the outside seam. The trousers were tucked into a pair of shiny black cavalry boots. Form-fitting black shirts were worn under a coat, 
the bottom of the coat cut high enough to expose the belt line of the pants. The left side of the coat buttoned closed over the right, in the approximate middle of the clavicle, but folded back at a diagonal, opening up at top of the manubrium, or just under the throat. Naruto and Jiraiya's coats had a gold cord that hung from the shoulder to the left pocket. A high collar came up to the chin and then folded down again. Correct. The samurai don't like ninja, and ninja don't like the samurai, so to keep them happy, we pretend to be one of them when in their territory. Nobody will mistake us as actual soldiers, but a show of discipline and formality will keep them happy, or at least willing to let us in. So we pretend to be part of the army so that they can pretend that there are no ninjas in their city. Tenton asked. Pretty much. It is silly and frankly ridiculous, but they are the ones running the show. And it is not that big a deal. They want to pretend we don't exist, let them, I say. Anyways, a few rules to follow while we are in the capital, whenever spoken to, let me answer or Naruto if I am not with you. A rule of thumb as enlisted soldiers is to be seen and not heard. The only time you should answer a question is if you are directly addressed. An officer is always to be called, sir, never by name unless otherwise indicated. When meeting someone, the lower ranking individual will salute first and then the higher ranking person will. In public, Naruto or I are to be referred to as, sir, and you will be called, sergeant, your full rank only used when an officer first addresses you, or in a formal setting. Generally speaking, you too, Jiraiya said pointing at the two women, treat officers as if they were God, and other enlisted soldiers as you would anyone else. When in doubt, do as I do. Jiraiya turned to speak to Naruto. Once we reach the capital, news of our arrival will travel pretty quickly. You are going to have to address the daimyo at some point, so you have to make sure that you make a good first impression. We will be put off at first, possibly up to a week, to see what kind of person you are. I know the daimyo, and he will decide whether to approve your request or not based on what kind of person he thinks you are as much as the actual merits of your argument. The army does not start recruiting until 18, so everyone will have at least 10 years on you, probably closer to 20. Many will try to test you by insulting you or ignoring you. You cannot allow that. The traits the daimyo respects most are charisma and strength. If a lower ranking officer or enlisted soldier fails to make his obeisance, you have stop and press the issue until they do, short of physical violence. The majority of those you will encounter will see a 13 year old kid and not your double silver bars. It is important that you display the proper force of will, if you don't the daimyo will most likely deny your petition. What about Hanada chan and Tenten chan What applies to you also applies to them, but it is less important that they act their rank. The only trouble they should get is from an officer who takes offense at their gender. Any enlisted man would have more than enough sense to leave either of them alone. Insubordination is only for the politically ambitious and really stupid, Few officers would gain anything from showing Tenten or Hanada up. The only reason anyone would try to mess with your women is to get at you. In any case, the National Army does not accept women into their ranks, so they will stick out like a sore thumb, but not much more than you will. Ooh, it was early morning before the group walked up to the great gates of the capital. The walls extended as far as the eye could see, constructed of silver streaked white stone without a visible join or crease. The walls were easily as high as Konoha's. And manned far more heavily. There was not much of a line waiting for admittance, but Jiraiya breezed past those waiting and addressed the sergeant standing in the doorway of the guardhouse. Your name, sir? Lieutenant General Kyushu Jiraiya, accompanied by Captain Hayuga Naruto, and Command Sergeants Major Hayuga Hanada and Higarashi Tenten. Reason for visit? The sergeant flicked his gaze to the three teens and put two and two together. But Jiraiya saw the metaphorical light bulb click on over the man's head and saw him catch himself before he scowled at them. I seek an audience with the fire daimyo. Were the man in question anything less than general rank, the sergeant would have questioned Jiraiya further, but he knew he was not likely to get a better answer. Besides, whatever the lieutenant general wanted, it likely was political, and that was far above his pay grade. The fact that the lieutenant general was not actually a lieutenant general was irrelevant. Jiraiya of the Sanin was well known, even outside the shinobi world, and he knew that the man could gut him without a second thought. That and the fact that he was accompanied by three children, one of which was a field officer only made it even more obvious that they were shinobi, were it necessary. But they were following the proper protocols, and so the sergeant said nothing. 
Shinobi provided distasteful, but critical services to the government, and according to the unwritten rules, as long as they pretended to be soldiers, and did not draw undue attention to themselves, he had no reason to deny them entrance. Stamping Jiraiya's well-thumbed passport, as well as the three children's all but virgin ones, he saluted and let them in. Urashima military city was a seething metropolis hundreds of times bigger than port city. The captain and two sergeants stared in wonder at the sights within the walls. Jiraiya, immune to such strode on. Back in Konoha, other than the Hokage's tower, there were few building over three stories. Here, most were at least five, some rising ten or more, and the broad boulevard they were on was at least four times as wide as any back home. Here the streets were at least thirty feet wide to a side, a median with thick green grass and small trees dividing the two sides. Anywhere else, Naruto would have said that the flagstone streets were excessively wide, but the crowd further on proved that they were as wide as they needed to be. Next was the sound. The chatter of a hundred thousand voices, the brays of thousands of oxen and whinnies of horses, the squeal of a hundred ungreased axles, the snap of dozens of whips all created a clamor of incredible volume. Finally was the smell. Sunbaked cobbles, unwashed bodies, the grassy scent of horse dung and a thousand other odors created a smell that was quite unlike anything else Naruto or the two girls had experienced. It was not exactly unpleasant, but it was far from palatable. Suddenly bursting out in laughter, Naruto wrapped his arms around Hinata, who was the one closest to him, and bent her over, kissing her enthusiastically. Naruto laughed again at the looks he got. This is it, he said. This is where it will start, the beginning of my master plan. Calm down Naruto. Do not forget, nothing has been approved yet. Your entire plan is still contingent on the fire daimyo's approval. And he is by no means certain to do that. I know that Aero Senen, Naruto replied, but it is just being so close has me excited. Well, as long as you know that, now, we need to get ourselves established somewhere. It will be a few days before we will be able to see the daimyo, and we need to have a place to wait until then. Naruto nodded and the three teens followed. What do you three know of Urashima military city? Jiraiya asked, but continued before any of his students had the chance to answer. Urashima military city, also known as the two-tone city has been around in one form or another for the last two or three hundred years. It wasn't until the formation of the hidden village that the capital of the fire country was relocated here and the city renamed after the daimyo who engineered the treaty that led to the creation of Konoha, Urashima Hideyoshi. Originally the location of the fire country's high command, it was not until the relocation of the capital that the white and black cities were formed. The reason behind the name was instantly apparent. When the daimyo decided to move his capital here, the original town was surrounded by what would come to be called the White City, and as the civilian half of town. As you can probably guess, the White City is called the White City because of the white outer wall and the whitewashed stone and brick the buildings are made of. The inner part of the city is called the Black City from the jagged spike of black rock that the rest of the capital is built around. The mountain was small in the measure of such things, only about 1,000 feet, but it was still the highest point for hundreds of miles. The mountain has been hollowed out and filled with miles and miles of corridors, rooms, halls and audience chambers to fit all the accoutrements of the bureaucracy. The stone that was been removed was used to build the military base surrounding the base of the mountain and the wall surrounding it all. The final redoubt is one of the major reasons why the fire country has never been fully conquered. It is said, more than half seriously that whoever controls the final redoubt, controls the fire country. And they could see why. The outermost white wall was huge, twenty feet tall or so, and half as wide, but the wall surrounding the mountain was considerably larger. Naruto estimated that it had to be at least fifty feet tall and he could only guess how thick. Conversation lapsed as Jiraiya led them through the warren of side streets until they arrived at a smallish three-story structure only a hundred yards from the black inner wall. Apparently, the main thoroughfare that the main gate opened to circled the black city one and a half times, spiraling in towards the black city, terminating at a gate on the opposite side of the inner wall from the main gate. If one knew his or her way around the city, it was often faster to cut through the narrow alleyways and side streets that rarely continued in a straight line for more than 50 feet. It would have been a journey of minutes had they been able to travel on the roofs, but the rooftops were heavily patrolled by the city guards and took a dim view anyone trying to use the roofs as a shortcut, so dim in fact that it might as well be opaque. 
It took the better part of an hour to transverse the streets and arrive at the Flame of the West, a trip that would have taken five minutes anywhere else. The Flame was a whitewashed stone inn, the upper two stories overhanging the ground floor on all side, the brilliantly red clay shingled tiled roof proclaiming the building's purpose. Unlike most inns, there was no sign hanging over the door, a stylized tongue of red flame emblazoned on the plain wood door instead. Jiraiya breezed in through the door and was almost immediately greeted by a fat balding man wearing a spotted white apron. Jiraiya Kun. Welcome back, my old friend. The innkeeper quickly closed the distance between him and the Senan, taking the hand Jiraiya offered and pulling him into a hug. The innkeeper thumped Jiraiya's back several times before releasing him from his embrace. What are you doing here? And on official business, no less, he said, waving a hand at Jiraiya's uniform. Been a while since I have seen you all dressed up. Tell me about it, Jiraiya replied. Must have been right after that thing with the Hyuga, what ten years ago now? Something like that, the innkeeper agreed. In any case, what has brought you back to our great capital? Shinobi business, Jiraiya muttered. I figured, care to share? Not at the moment, but you should be hearing about it soon enough. Well, when have you ever left the city in the same state that you arrived in? Well, there was that one time during the Third Shinobi War. That doesn't count. One, you were only here for a few hours, and two you were hiding in the cellar the entire time. It isn't my fault that the damn three storms were on my ass. That would be debatable. In any case, you going to introduce your companions? I might as well Ben. Ben, these are my students, Hayuga Naruto and Hinata and Higurashi Tenten. Naruto, Hinata. Tenten, this is Nakamura Benji. Students, been a long time since you have taught anything? Not since Minato and his team, Jiraiya agreed. Examining Naruto, Benji's eyes widened in surprise. Say, you wouldn't happen to be the Lightning Legion would you? Yeah, Naruto replied carefully, how do you know about that? How do I know about it, kid, half the country knows about you. Tapes of the final exam sold out in record time. Wait, what? tapes of the final exam. Yeah, you didn't think that the Chunin exams were only watched in Konoha did you? Uh, yeah, I kinda did. Well, here's news for you kid. The Chunin exams are one of the most highly publicized events in the world. Live broadcasts are only in whatever village it is being held in because of the lack of long distance infrastructure, but the tapes of the exams are sold all around the world eventually. It would be hard to say whether it will be sold in Earth or Lightning countries first but it will get there eventually. Of course, the results are known as quickly as distance allows, but it takes quite a bit longer for videos to be available. So I am world famous then? I wouldn't say that, Brad. You don't get to be called famous until you are in at least three bingo books. It is okay to admit you were jealous, Aero Senen. After all, it was not until you duked it out with Hanzo that you became famous. I am only 12 and I will soon be as well known as you are. Jiraiya rolled his eyes. Whatever brat. I have nothing to prove to you. Ben, would you mind showing us to our rooms? Benji slapped himself on the forehead. Of course. Here I am leaving you out in the entryway. Come, I'll show you where you will stay. The four soldiers picked up their luggage and followed the innkeeper up the stairs to their rooms. Benji gave them four of the better rooms adjacent to one another, not the best, but a far cry from the servants' quarters at the same time. None of their rooms had a sitting room but it was a lack that nobody missed. Everyone quickly unpacked their possessions and regrouped in a private dining room that Benji had given them. Jiraiya and Naruto left a few minutes later, Jiraiya giving Hinata and Tenten the rest of the day to be at liberty, warning them to be careful and not get lost. The three teenage ninja had taken notice of the occasional patrol of soldiers while in the White City, but it wasn't until they entered the Black City was the army's presence really felt. Of course, the Black City was their part so it only made sense. And it only increased the closer they got to the final redoubt. Even at the outer edge of the Black City, there were a handful of civilians interspersed with the rifle-toting soldiers. In the White City, Hanada, Naruto and Tenten had mostly been ignored, but here in the Black City, it seemed that every pair of eyes was tracking Jiraiya and Naruto. Naruto rolled his shoulder uncomfortably at the sensation. Jiraiya put a large hand on Naruto's shoulder and gave the boy a wink. It was obvious that they were not real soldiers, Naruto's age marking them, but by the same token, 
Nobody accosted them as they approached the massive fortress that was the final redoubt. Covers were tipped and salutes exchanged where appropriate, and they were generally allowed to be, a few hard looks notwithstanding. Apparently what Jiraiya had said about the unwritten rules was true. Jiraiya was able to breeze in past the guards at the entrance of the mountain, but trying to gain an audience with the fire daimyo took a bit more effort. The two had arrived at the redoubt shortly before 11 in the morning, but it was closing in on 5 in the afternoon before anyone was willing to see them. Unwritten rules aside, it seemed that everybody else took priority over them. After hours and hours of doing nothing but twiddling their thumbs, they were finally allowed to see the major domo. The major domo was a surprisingly youthful man, thick lipped with a blonde flaxen beard braided into a square. The office was spacious, but not as much as one might expect from someone of his position. His desk, on the other hand, was fully ten feet from side to side, and nearly half that front to back, it was huge enough to make Naruto wonder how the man behind the mammoth desk was able to reach anything at the ends of the table. And there were things at each side, and all in between, little wire trays filled with paperwork stacked several high, using almost all of the space. As the four shinobi entered, the major domo tapped a thick sheaf of papers to line the edges up and clipped them together with a yellow metal binder clip. Uh, the blonde man tapped out a rapid pattern with his fingers against the surface of the desk and a wire tray glowed blue and floated over to him. Placing the sheaf of papers in it, he nudged it back towards where it had come from and it floated back to its place. Okay, that is one of the cooler seals I have seen. That has to be a seal in the desk there, am I right? Jiraiya gave Naruto a sharp glance as he took a step ahead of his student and gave a slight bow to the man behind the desk. Jiraiya-san, the blonde man stated with obvious displeasure, been several years since I have had the experience of your presence. Likewise were Zhao. And you know as well as I that I am only here because I must. My companions and I will be out of your city as soon as our business here is completed. And what would that business be? The man, were Zhao, asked. I seek an audience with our lord, on a matter of some urgency. Obviously, or you would not be here. I take it you have something more than just news, and want something outside your Hokage's authority? It concerns the Biju. Were Zhao frowned. You don't say. Anything concerning the Nine even tangentially is certainly worthy of notice. I take it that is why Uzumaki-san is here. Actually, it is Hyuga now, but what do you mean by that? The Major Domo sent Jiraiya a look which was returned with a shrug. The daimyo likes to be kept abreast of what happens in his hidden village. To get to the point, what do you need? I think I should let Naruto here explain, as it is him that is reason why we are here. Wurjao nodded at Naruto to step forward and speak. I am not sure how much you know, but essentially there is an organization hunting me and the other Jinchuriki. We don't know why, exactly, but whatever they want with the biju it can't to be to spread peace and love. According to our best intelligence, this group is composed solely of S-rank missing Nin. I want the daimyo's permission to approach the other Jinchuriki and form an organization to counter Akatsuki. And you need the daimyo's approval to approach any of the other Jinchuriki nations. Diplomatic credentials, free travel pass, etc., correct? Naruto nodded. Well, given that this is the first I have heard of this, I take it this is not time sensitive. Naruto glanced at Jiraiya. Well, they aren't supposed to make their move for another two years or so. What I thought, were Zhao interrupted. Tapping his desk, a wire rack levitated over to his little workspace. Unfortunately for you, the earliest I can schedule you for is the week after next. The daimyo holds audiences on the first and third Tuesdays of each month. The next audience I can schedule you for is October 5th. If you had gotten here two days ago, then you would have been able to see him yesterday, but as you did not you must wait. October 5th. We can't wait that long, were Zhao rounded on Naruto almost before the words were out of his mouth. Yes you will. As Jiraiya said, this Akatsuki is not expected to do anything for another two years at least. Now, if you had news of slightly greater import, I would try to get you an audience sooner, but as things are, you can wait. Am I not supposed to be a lord here or something, can't I demand to see him? You know about that? Well let me tell you something. You are only a lord in name only, and be grateful for that, as it is the only reason why you are being allowed to address the daimyo at all. You know the exit, see yourselves to it. Naruto opened his mouth to argue some more, but Jiraiya clamped his hand on Naruto's shoulder and steered him out of Wurjao's office. 
Wu Tenten had not wasted much time after Naruto and Jiraiya had departed before leaving the inn. Jiraiya had taken the most direct route to the flame on the way in, so they had gotten to see very little of the White City. Tenten made sure to keep track of her meandering, taking careful note of landmarks so that even if she were to get lost, she could find her way back to the general vicinity of the inn. Attired in her blue uniform under her trench coat, she had strapped her gun belt on over her pants. A 13 year old girl in army uniform and trench coat, she drew a great many looks, and not a few stares. None went past giving her a brief glare, and few even went that far. Nevertheless, Tenton pulled her arms from her sleeves and rested her hands on the grips of her pistols for comfort. One thing that she had noticed when they had entered the city was the kinds of guns that the enlisted soldiers seemed to carry. Her rifles were antiquated by the admission of the old man that had gifted her her first rifle, at least 20 years out of date. She had made a few small modifications to her firearms, most significantly the electrum plates used for her elemental cartridges, but for the most part, her original rifle and the copy remained unchanged from the manufacturer's specs. Her rifles were .577 caliber muzzle-loading rifles. The barrels were fairly long, the 39-inch barrel making the 55-inch long weapon less than half a foot shorter than her, and not exactly light, just under 10 pounds apiece. The rifles that the enlisted men carried seemed to be somewhat shorter, by maybe 6 or 7 inches. The rifles did not seem to be muzzle-loading either, with no ram visible. The trigger guard was stretched to cover the other three fingers of the trigger hand, although none she saw had any sort of scope mounted on them. Even the officers seemed to carry a more modern pistol similar enough to what she used, except what appeared to be some sort of grooved cylinder above the trigger, she couldn't very well go up and ask to have one, so she did the next best thing. The various rank insignias were still fairly fresh in her mind, so she picked a spot in front of what seemed to be an inn or tavern and seated herself on a bench placed there. There were a couple of battered in cups attached to the bench, presumably so that sitters could sit outside and have a cup of wine or beer or tea or whatever they happened to drink without the owner of the establishment worrying about having his cups stolen. Although, it probably would not take much effort to snap the chain and walk away. Tenton did not wait long, a group of three privates and a corporal passing by in short order. Taking a bracing breath, Tenton stood up, squared her shoulders, and strode up before the soldiers. She had put her trench coat away in a scroll so her rank was plainly visible to four men in front of her. Sergeant, the four enlisted halted before Tenton, saluting. Tenton returned the salute and asked, Where are you four going, Corporal? Ah, nowhere in particular, Sergeant. Higurashi, Command Sergeant Major Higurashi. Just on routine patrol Sergeant Higurashi. Good. Follow me. Tenton turned away and gave the soldiers a wave motioning for them to follow her. She led the way into the building that she had been sitting outside of. It was an inn, not quite as prosperous or well kept as the Flame of the West, but as long as it had a private dining room, it would be good enough for her needs. The sudden entrance of five soldiers did not go unnoticed, the innkeeper hurrying over immediately. Morning, sergeant, but he was cut off before he got any further. I have need of one of your private dining rooms for an hour. Ah, of course. If you do not mind my asking, what exactly do you need? Just a private room for a little while is all. An hour, and we will be gone. You will be compensated, of course, for the use of your dining room. Of course, the innkeeper agreed. Gesturing to the hallway, he led the five to the well appointed dining room partway down the hall. Tenton led the four soldiers into the room, closing the door behind them. The four soldiers came to something halfway between attention and parade rest when the door closed, sealing them in with Tenton. All four were relatively young, the corporal not older than twenty or so, faces roughened by whiskers, yet still bearing traces of acne. Tenton had turned from the four men, pulling out a blank scroll and unrolling it across the length of the table. A pen and a set of small screwdrivers and a matching magnifying glass were placed on the paper before Tenton faced the four soldiers that she had commandeered. Pointing she said, give me your weapon, private. The private in question hesitated, starting to slip his rifle from his shoulder, but looking toward his corporal at the same time. The corporal only hesitated for a split second before stepping forward, one arm outstretched to keep the private behind him. Sergeant, I am sorry but I feel that I must ask what exactly is going on here. Nothing sinister, I assure you corporal, I just wish to have a look at your firearm is all. And why is that? 
because, yours seems to be of significantly more advanced design than any of mine are, and simply put, I want to see how it works. Tenton gestured to the table behind her, where the scroll, jeweler's tools and pen was. My guns are. Antiquated. To say the least. All I want is to see how yours work, so that I can improve upon mine. Guns, as in plural? The corporal asked. Several, Tenton confirmed. Are they muzzle loading, or breech loading? Breach loading? Do you load them from the front or the back? Front. Well, I could see why you would carry several around then. You are probably using a pattern, 53, quite popular in the country. 0.577 caliber, with three bands. Yeah, old, but reliable. The corporal seemed to size her up for a moment. Probably about as tall as you are, if not taller. I have six inches on the longest of my guns, you know. Tenton was beginning to feel a little uneasy with the corporal, chatty as he was. Jiraiya had said that they were not likely to receive a warm welcome in the city, but the corporal was being quite friendly, enough to put her guard up. She was not like Hinata, in so much as she did not have a valuable bloodline, nor was she like Naruto, who was already making a name for himself. The only thing that was worth kidnapping her over only one other person should know about, and he was the last person to go spilling the beans. I don't mean to look a gift horse in the mouth, but why are you being so helpful? You know I am not actually a soldier in your chain of command. I take it that this is your first time in the capital? Tenton nodded, and you were told about the unwritten rules, obviously. Another nod. And were told about the anti ninja bias that most officers hold? One last nod. Well, for the most part, it is only the samurai, and by extension the officer corps, that do not get along with your kind. Most enlisted soldiers don't have much of a problem with you. I see. The corporal turned and picked his rifle up from where it had been resting against the wall. This is a model, 92 lever action repeating rifle. Now, the biggest difference between your pattern, 53 three band and these is that it is, as I already said, a repeating rifle. The corporal laid the gun down on the table and took one of 1010's smaller screwdrivers and opened the side of the rifle. The corporal methodically disassembled his gun making sure that Tenton fully understood each part functioned. It actually took closer to two hours than one, but by the end, Tenton had a complete schematic of the model, 92 repeating rifle, and an idea or two on how to make it even better. Tenton led the four men back outside. Tenton made her way back to the inn that she and the others were staying in slowly, strolling along at a sedate pace, taking in the sights as it were. Tenton had not been as sheltered as Naruto or Hinata had been having visited other towns in fire country with her father on business, but even Port City was nothing in comparison to Urashima military city. The Black Mountain that was the final redoubt loomed large over the city, omnipresent, a constant weight pressing on her. She only got lost twice in the rabbit's warren of side streets that composed the greater part of the White City despite the careful mental notes she had taken when leaving the inn, something that surprised even herself. Who unlike Naruto, who had gone with Jiraiya to try to get an audience with the fire daimyo in the Black City, and Tenten, who had wanted to explore the White City, Hanada had chosen to remain at the inn. She had returned to her room as soon as Jiraiya had given her and Tenten permission to leave. Unrolling the large luggage scroll that everything else had been packed in, she quickly found the scroll that her father had given to her before leaving. It was smaller than the luggage scroll by a good bit, only about a foot and a half tall and about six or eight inches thick but it was crammed with handwritten text, with hardly any margins left. There were illustrations of stances, diagrams of chakra, all drawn as small as they could be and still be legible. Hanada could scarcely believe that she held one of only two scrolls that held instructions for the dim mock. The Jukin was lethal enough, designed as it was to target the soft innards of a human being, yet the dim mock was a step above and beyond the Jukin. Jukin was unique among martial arts styles in the fact that it was based on the manipulation of chakra. Many styles used chakra in one form or another, to either strengthen or speed up the body, but none were based on the use of chakra. And even then, the Jukin totally eschewed any sort of elemental manipulation, relying completely on inert, neutral chakra. Some styles imitated one element or another, for example Maida Guy's strong fist was based on hard, fast strikes much like earth techniques, even if it did not actually use the earth-natured chakra, or the Uchiha's intercepting fist, mostly reactive to play to the strengths of the Sharingan, resembled water techniques. 
While the Jukin was unique in its use of neutral chakra, the Dim Mok was equally unique in its use of Yin chakra exclusively. The first exercise on the scroll was on how to master Yin and Yang chakra. The concept of Yin and Yang chakra was a mostly cerebral one, in that Yin and Yang chakra, together, was what was generally referred to as neutral, inert, or non elemental chakra. Yin and Yang chakra was the basis of all Nin and Genjutsu. To use an architectural metaphor, Yin and Yang chakra could be compared to the foundation of a building. Every single building had a foundation of some sort, some more extensive than others, but the foundation was still there. Transformation and clone techniques, medical techniques, as well as the Naras and Akamichi's secret techniques could technically be classified as Yin Yang release, as the effects of the two techniques were created by altering the ratios of Yin to Yang. That was easy enough, as the ranking of most non elemental jutsu proved. But separating them, it was like trying to remove creamer from coffee. Impossible. One could add more coffee or more creamer, but removing one from the other simply could not be done. Still, Hanada persevered, mediating like the scroll told her to, trying to do just that. She dared not skip this, the scroll was explicit on that point. The ability to divide yin and yang chakra was essential to the dim mock. Usunade had known that it was only a matter of time. But that did not mean that when Danzo stepped into her office, she was pleased to see him. She barely batted an eye when Kaharu and Homura followed Danzo into the room. She had not expected those two to appear, but it was not much of a surprise either. Despite Danzo and Hiruzen's enmity, the Sandame's former teammates were sometime allies of Danzo's. Tsunade gave each a polite nod, which was returned and gestured for them to take their seats. Kaharu and Homura did, while Danzo remained standing. You have made a grave error, Tsunade. Really, the Hokage drawled in reply. I know that I am growing old and feeble, so if you could perhaps refresh my memory for me? Danzo scowled. Do not play the fool, it does not suit you, you know exactly what I am talking about. I honestly do not, Danzo. The Uzumaki boy, he was sent out of the village on a high risk and long term mission, he must be recalled immediately. Oh, the eyes only, top secret. A rank mission he was assigned. The mission that you are not supposed to know about. Tsunade was not wearing her official robes, nor her hat of office, but it was clear from her posture, back straight, hands folded on the desk and eyes slightly narrowed, that she did not need them to prove her authority. Precisely, Danzo replied without losing a beat. I suppose it should be expected, and I can sympathize with him, and his goals are admirable, but you have to realize that he is on a fool's errand. No, Danzo. I do not. Danzo pursed his lips in irritation. Tsunade, that boy is out ace in the hole, our weapon of last resort. Sending him out into enemy territory without any protection is. Watch how you finish that sentence, Danzo. Do I need to remind you that you stand in front of your Hokage? I appreciate your concern, even if you should not know anything to be concerned about in the first place, but it is misplaced. He is stronger than you might think, and has Jiraiya escorting him. Be that as it may, your former teammate is only one man. Can he take on the whole of Iwagakure, or Kumogakure should things take a turn for the worse, assuming he even makes it that far? His identity has been a closely held secret for good reasons, but he does bear an unmistakable resemblance to his father. Tsunade, you must realize that the boy is completely unsuited for such a task in the first place. He has no diplomatic training, and given his propensity for rash action, do you think that he could behave in a manner that would be required of him? It had been agreed beforehand that Danzo would be allowed to lead the three of them against the Hokage, but Homura and Kaharu would speak up when Tsunade denied Danzo. He is going to have to interact with heads of state and village leaders, Homura continued. Or is Jiraiya planning to act for the boy? And that is completely disregarding the extremely high chance that he would be denied entrance into the lands of stone or lightning. Kaharu had taken her seat on the other side of Danzo from Homura, adopting a nearly identical posture. And that would be the best of all options. I cannot imagine what we would do if he were to be taken captive. Kumo already has the two and eight tails. Adding the nine tails to them, they would be the undisputed strongest village. We only maintain our position by a narrow margin, relying on the reputations of our S class Nin, such as yourself and Jiraiya kun, and our more famous Junin such as the Sandame's son, Kakashi and Guy. Kaharu was cut off by the sharp crack of Tsunade's palm slapping down on the polished surface of her desk. 
There was nothing gentle in the glare that she directed at the three elders. I appreciate your concern for Naruto, but you overstep yourselves. I remind you that you three are advisors, nothing more. I will call on you when I wish to hear your opinion, and only then. Danzo, I realize that you are only doing this because you genuinely believe that I am wrong, but do not mistake me for the Sandame. You have provided valuable and irreplaceable service in the past, but I will not tolerate your interference. I will not tell you to stop having my office watched, but I will tell you to not do anything that would force me to move against you, and that includes sending any of your off-the-books ninja after Naruto. You and your organization belong in the shadows where you can do the most good, and I hope that you will not make me pull you from them. Trust me when I say that you would quickly wither in the light. Come to me in this manner again and I will destroy you. Danzo stared at Tsunade for a few seconds before nodding his head in acquiescence. You aren't going to tell me to stay away from my former soldiers? No for one, I know you would disobey me behind my back, so I will not bother. Unlike my predecessor, I do see the value in having a force that cannot be proven to exist. Danzo gave another nod. But do not think that means you can do as you please with them. If I have the slightest suspicion that you might be using Root in any way that I would disapprove of, I will not hesitate to eradicate you both. Clear? Perfectly, Hokage sama. That said, I want a full report on Root. Do not say anything, Danzo. I want to know about personnel, materiel, mission capability, etc. Naruto is out there trying to create an organization to counter Akatsuki. But in order to do that, he will need the full support of Konoha behind him. And that includes Root. So you will give me a complete report on the status and capability of Root when I want it. I will not tolerate independent factions of Konoha Shinobi operating within this village without my knowledge and direction. You will be used by me or I will see you destroyed. For the first time in what seemed to be decades, Danzo smiled. Not a cat got the mouse smile, but a smile of actual pleasure. Of course, Hokage-sama. I have always held the well-being of Konoha to be my utmost priority. Half the reason why I formed Root was to protect Konoha. I am but a weapon to be used for the protection of Konoha. Bowing from the waist, Danzo asked, Is there anything else, Hokage-sama? There is much I must do if the report is to be ready when you want it. Naruto woke up the morning after his and Jiraiya's meeting with the the fire daimyo's majordomo in a bad mood. It was September 25th, and he had ten days to wait before he would be able to see the daimyo. Ten days, with nothing to do but twiddle his thumbs. Just the thought of having to wait that long already had him antsy. Naruto was capable of being patient, as long as it was to a purpose. This however, seemed utterly pointless, and mean-spirited besides. He was sure the wait was the majordomo's way of exerting his bureaucratic control over him, and while there were many things he hated, having to obey pointless orders was definitely in the top ten. He threw his covers aside and sat up. Rubbing his eyes to clear them of the sleepies, he swung his feet over the side of the bed and rose. His room had a small bathroom attached, barely large enough to hold the sink, toilet and cubicle shower. He showered, brushed his teeth, changed into his freshly laundered blue army uniform, draping his coat over his shoulder, dropping his dirty laundry in the basket and went downstairs to the common room for breakfast. It only took a single quick scan of the room to find where the rest of his team was sitting. Three figures he expected to see were seated across from two he had not. Jiraiya, Hanada and Tenten were seated at a table on the far side of the room, near a cold hearth, with his mother and Asuma sitting on the other side. Both were dressed, but neither in their usual attire. Like Jiraiya, Hanada, Tenten and himself, they both wore the blue formal dress uniforms, but Anko had a pair of red squares on her shoulders, while a stylized tongue of flame rode on Asuma's shoulder boards, not dissimilar to the one on the door of the inn. Mom, Asuma Sensei, what are you two doing here? Much the same that you are, I would assume. The daimyo requested a sealing expert from Konoha, and I was sent. Asuma is here to babysit me. Naruto cocked an eyebrow at that. Hey, I am the one who taught you sealing, at least at first, remember? That isn't what I was thinking. I am just surprised that the Hokage herself didn't come to make sure you stay out of trouble, and you know exactly what I mean, mom. Anko scowled. You know, I am starting to wonder what the hell I did to get this kind of reaction from everyone. I mean I have never terrorized any civilians, never destroyed any privately owned property, never destroyed a bar on a drunken binge or kept the neighbors up all night or anything. 
and don't mention that time you got mugged either. That was a one-off. Well, what about that other time with Kakashi Sensei? You didn't get up until dinner. Again, that was one time. One time. Never happened again, never will. Sides, that was halfway your fault in the first place. Nah. No way you were pinning that one on me. You started it when you put freaking explosive seals on the ramen cupboard. We had to get a new refrigerator. Yeah, well, you learned your lesson about trying to sneak anything past me, didn't you? Only because, well you know, you put explosive seals on the ramen cupboard, seals, as in plural. That resulted in several raised eyebrows. Fortunately for everyone involved, the common room was mostly empty, and what patrons there were were smart enough to pretend nothing was happening. They always like this? Asuma asked. No, Tenton said. They're usually worse. This time it was Asuma that cocked the eyebrow. No punches thrown, no furniture broken. Yet, Hinata said by way of explanation. Ah, you know, this explains so much that it is not even funny. Don't worry, you get used to it after a while. There was a thump, as mother and son engaged in fisticuffs, Anko almost pinning Naruto with a headlock. Naruto somehow managing to twist an arm back, up and around to grab a fistful of Anko's hair. Uh, you sure we shouldn't be doing anything? Asuma asked again. Not yet. Wait for it, wait for it. There, now you can. A pause. It is going to have to be one of you two, because neither Tenton nor I are strong enough to do it. By now, Naruto had wriggled out of Anko's headlock and was gnawing on her forearm, while Anko was slamming her elbow into the back of his head over and over. With a put-upon sigh, Jiraiya pushed his end of the bench back and moved to separate the pair. Jiraiya was a big man, so he was able to pull the brawling duo apart without much effort. So what are all you doing here? I'm not too surprised to see Jiraiya and Naruto here, but what is with you two? Anko pointed at the two genin. It is a little complicated, Tenton answered. I have barely been gone a month, how much could have happened? A pause, traded glances. Seriously? What the hell happened? The short version is Sasuke tried to go rogue a couple of days after you left, Hanada, Tenten, Shikamaru, Neji and I brought him back, got apprenticed to, to the pervert for real this time and am trying to get permission to leave the country to unite the other Jinchuriki against Akatsuki. Damn, someone has been a busy little beaver. Naruto just shrugged. I assume you know your chances. Naruto released an aggrieved sigh. As everyone is prone to telling me, yes, I know it is a long shot. But the way I figure it, the hardest part will be getting everyone to the table. Once I get everyone to just meet, half the battle is already won. Well, you are already pretty friendly with the Mist Jinchuriki, one of them at least. Do you have a plan to get the Stone and Cloud Jinchuriki to the table? I will figure something out when I get to that point. Right, this is my son we are talking about here. Well, I suppose that is as good a plan as any. Unless you have a better one? Everyone else seems to. Hey, don't get snippy with me, sorry. Well, you certainly have your work cut out for you, I am sure you have been told how hard it is going to be, so I won't say anything further on that subject. I just hope that you won't be too disappointed if everything doesn't go to plan. Anko put her hands up in surrender at Naruto's look. Okay, okay, I'm done. Breakfast arrived then and conversation ceased for the next few minutes. Anko and Asuma waved goodbye and departed soon after. The serving girl was collecting their plates and utensils as Jiraiya addressed his pupils. Well, we have ten days until Naruto and I have to meet the daimyo so why don't we get started with your training? Actually, I was hoping that we could have the day off today, Naruto said. What for? Jiraiya asked back. Personal time, Naruto replied, jaw already thrust out in preparation for a fight. There is, listen, Aero Senen, though we haven't had a break in months. First it was the mission to grass, then it was the chunin exams, then it was the invasion, then we had to go get Sasuke back. I haven't been on a date with either of my girls in far too long. So we are going to take today off, put off work and training for 24 hours and do something for us. The world isn't going to end, and there is nothing you can teach that cannot wait for tomorrow. Would you can it for a moment? I was going to say, you could take them to see the new Funheim movie that just came out. You know, a dinner and a movie thing but if you have a better idea. Now it was Naruto's turn to frown, you mean you don't care? Jiraiya giggled. Hey kid, 
I ain't your mother, and it is not place to deny true love. Sides, still got over a week till we can even find out if we can get out of here. And like Yaw said, I don't have anything to teach you that can't wait. Well, good. Naruto gave a sharp nod. He clearly had been expecting more resistance, and clearly had set himself to argue. Offering an arm to Tenten and Hinata, the trio departed the inn. Naruto did not have any particular destination in mind, but the girls did not mind. They wandered the streets, taking turns more or less at random when one of the three saw something that piqued their interest. Eventually, the threesome found themselves in a bazaar in the commercial district. The clamor was astounding, merchants manning stalls claiming that his meat pies were made of the freshest meat, the hottest sauces. Her jewelry was made of the highest quality, flawless stones. Their knives would never dull, and could even cut through the toughest grist and bone with unparalleled ease. Naruto, Hanada and Tenten wandered through the bustling crowd in a little pocket of clear space, the crowd parting around the three, almost as if by happenstance. And they were not the only ones to receive such treatment. Patrolling soldiers were made way for, but the occasional monk, both proper Shinto Kanushi and informal spiritualists, and men wearing dark, close-fitting robes, a small square of white showing at the throat traveled in pockets as well. The robed men wore odd blades on their hips, cruciform and straight, rather than the more traditional katanas that most swordsmen used. Both the black-robed men and the monk carried themselves as important men, and even patrolling soldier made way from them. Seeing the nominal keepers of the peace make way for the two groups, Team 9 did so as well. None of the three knew anything about the black and blue-robed men, but Naruto did not want to risk a confrontation with anyone the daimyo might hold favor with, and given that the military police seemed to defer to them, it seemed to be a logical conclusion that both groups possessed some measure of authority. In any case, the trio made their way through the bazaar without incident, and the rest of the day as well. They managed to find their way back to the inn after only having to stop for directions twice, just in time for dinner. As had been said before, Urashima military city was on the order of magnitudes larger and more populous than Konoha even had the potential to be. Normally, a day on his feet wouldn't have caused Naruto to break a sweat, but between the crowds, the sights and sounds, new foods to try and people to see, Naruto found himself exhausted. Not the bone-deep weariness that came after an injury, or channeling the Kyubi's chakra, just a tiredness that a good night's sleep would cure. The three adults said nothing as Tenten and Hinata, much in the same condition as Naruto wandered off to bed soon after dinner. U Naruto woke in his room the next morning, took a shower, got dressed and ate breakfast, much as he had the previous morning. It was not precisely early, but nor was it very late in the morning, so when Jiraiya reported that both Anko and Asuma had already left for the Black City. I wonder how long they are going to be here, he asked nobody in particular as he ate a bowl of rice. Probably longer than we are, should things go according to plan, it isn't often that the daimyo requests someone from Konoha for a sealing job. The samurai have several experts in the field themselves, so when he does, it is usually for a big job. Then how come you weren't sent? Kid, I am one of, oh, probably top five or so sealing adepts in the world. As you know, you pay for what you get. I rarely get called out for a sealing job as my expertise is usually prohibitively expensive. Like how expensive? Jiraiya chuckled. You wouldn't break the bank, but most smaller countries would have to dig deep. Generally speaking, anything under S rank can get handed off to someone else. Naruto looked skeptical. Kid, have you seen what we charge for S rank missions? No, Naruto said slowly. 10 million is the absolute lowest. 12 or 13 is more usual. Although, at the same time, most S rank missions are run for Konoha itself, so there is that as well. Damn. Even Tenten and Hinata looked a little impressed. S rank missions have to be very profitable, because by their nature they are incredibly dangerous, in more ways than one. The chance of losing some of your most skilled ninja is very high, as are the potential repercussions should the mission be blown. Ninja are expensive, for damn good reasons. And we like it that way. Just about the only missions that your average Joe can afford are D ranks, and those are only offered in the villages themselves. Every time a ninja leaves the village, there is a chance that he or she is not coming back, and ninja are not cheap to train, both in time and resources. Finishing his tea in one last gulp, Jiraiya smacked his lips and sighed. You ready to begin training then? Ah, 
was as far as Naruto got before Jiraiya broke in. Naruto, when I accepted you as my apprentice, you said that you would do everything and anything that I required of you. I gave you yesterday off, as I know you haven't had much time off recently, but you cannot keep slacking. Did I make a mistake in taking you as my apprentice? Ah, no, Naruto was quick to say. Just the morning. There is something that I want to do. Won't last past lunch, I swear. Jiraiya narrowed his eyes in suspicion, but relented. Until lunch then, he left without another word. Naruto-kun? Hanada asked, speaking for the first time since she and Tenten had come down to the common room. Don't worry, he'll be fine. Probably, if you say so, Tenten replied, suppressing a smile. So what is it you wanted to do? Wait until we get to my room. Your room? You aren't planning anything, perverted are you? Tenten said. Because you know that nooners aren't healthy, Hanada innocently. Arg, I am not taking you two up. He paused, peering at the two suspiciously. Who said nooners aren't healthy? People, the pair chorused. You two are spending way too much time together, and stop ganging up on me. Says the one who can make a thousand shadow clones without breaking a sweat. She has a point, Hanada agreed. I mean, it isn't like you couldn't summon a couple of shadow clones and kidnap us to ravish us into unconsciousness whenever you like. But then again, what would your mother think? Abducting two innocent girls to hide away in some tower that only you can get into, for your nefarious schemes. Way, way, way too much time together, and my mother, and Jiraiya too, for that matter. This caused Hanada and Tenten to break out in giggles, still moving more or less in tandem. They leaned over to Naruto and planted a kiss on each cheek. Don't worry, Naruto-kun. We know you wouldn't do anything to hurt us. Unless we wanted you to. Naruto just let his head fall to his crossed arms. Sitting back up suddenly, he summoned a shadow clone and threw Hinata and Tenten over a shoulder, hurrying back up the stairs. The common room remained silent for several seconds afterwards. You don't think he is really going to take them up to his room to ravish them into unconsciousness, do you? Probably not, Benji said. He is only 13 you know, still everyone stared up at the stairs for several seconds after that. Ooh, ravishing time? Tenten asked once they were alone. Okay, you know that if you keep that up, I will start to think that you want me to. Who says we don't? Naruto really did not know how to reply to that. Alright, if we can cut the sexual innuendo for a moment, I will tell you why I brought you up here. Sitting up straight. Hanada and Tenten dropped their smiles and gave Naruto their serious attention. We are listening, Naruto-kun, Hanada said for the both of them. There is something I want the two of you to learn, the Rasengan. The Rasengan? That is an A-rank technique. Tenten's eyebrows had arched in surprise. Yeah, I know, and I want the two of you to start learning it. I know, he said, forestalling Tenten with an upraised hand, it is a really high-level technique and I don't expect either of you to learn it overnight, but I want you to start. Neither of you have a one-hit kill technique, and Tenten, you really don't have any hand-to-hand -hand techs. I want you to learn it so that you do have an ace in the hole of sorts. You are both two of the strongest kunoichi I know, but I can't help but worry when you end up fighting without me. I worry, and I can't help it. Having the you at least working on the Rasengan won't make me worry less, but it would make me feel better. We will try, Naruto-kun if it makes you feel better. It does, he assured Hinata. Tossing each woman a water balloon. Stage 1. Pop the water balloon. Hinata and Tenten both glanced at the water balloon, then back to Naruto. I assume we aren't allowed to poke it with a needle? Naruto gave Tenten a look and held his own water balloon in his left hand. In his right he created a Rasengan. Carefully channeling chakra into the water balloon in his left hand, he let the chakra go wild releasing just enough chakra to make the balloon deform in a dozen different directions. The first stage is learning to pop the water balloon by spinning the water inside it. The Rasengan training has three stages, first, to create the spin, second, to add power and third to add control. The trick is to spin the water in a whole bunch of directions at once. If you just spin it in one direction, like this, he said, demonstrating, all it does is flatten out. But if you spin it a bunch of ways, then it pops, and did just that. The kunoichi exchanged glances and set to. Of course, having already mastered the technique in question, Naruto was able to make it appear easier than it was. 
Given that the first stage was nothing but an extremely advanced chakra control exercise, Hanada was the first one to master it. The clock sitting on the bureau showed it was a little after one. Naruto had been doing his own training, holding a Rasengan in his right hand, and trying to form one in his left. In the academy, his chakra control had been fairly bad, but between all the extra practice, learning new chakra exercises and the Rasengan, his control was well above average. Judging solely on the sheer difficulty of the technique, the Rasengan more than qualified for an A ranking. Forming dual Rasengans wasn't quite on the level of elemental recombination, which was about as difficult as looking left and right at the same time, but it wasn't far short. Forming a single Rasengan was a simple task now, requiring little more attention than any other technique, but the moment he drew his focus away to form a second one, the first started to destabilize. Naruto wasn't deterred in the least. Jiraiya could do it, and he would be able to. He just had to keep at it. Both Hinata and Tenten were beginning to tire when Hinata finally managed to pop her balloon. Hinata jumped in her chair at the abrupt dousing, as well as Tenten, who got splashed as well. Nobody said anything for a moment, until Naruto laughed. Good job Hinata-chan, Naruto congratulated her, a wide grin curving Hinata's lips. Naruto let his Rasengan dissipate, rising to his feet. Well. I can't say that I was expecting either of you to get it on the first day, but I am impressed. Anyways, I think this makes a good time to stop for lunch. What do you think? He asked them both. A good idea, Tenten said, shaking her stinging palms. Hanada concurred, and the trio went down to the common room. Naruto took Tenten's hands, gently massaging her aching digits as they descended the stairs. Naruto sat between the two women as they ate, giving each all of his attention. The common room was fuller than it had been at breakfast, somewhere between half and three quarters full, few enough that each group could have a table or booth to themselves. Patrons consisted of the middle of the road local shop owners and merchants, and slightly wealthier foreigners. The room was filled with a comfortable babble, not subdued, but not loud enough that one had to shout to be heard. There were a number of merchants conducting business, dipping fingers in wine and scribing figures on the worn polish of the tables. Nobody gave the teens a second glance as they seated themselves at a table near the kitchen. A few of the closer diners tugged a forelock or gave a careful nod, but no one made issue with the trio apparently getting the cook's priority. Naruto pushed the bench back from the table as a serving girl swept by collecting their empty bowls and spoons. Naruto and Hinata headed toward the stairs following Jiraiya but Tenten didn't. I am going to head out for a bit, Naruto-kun. I got an errand or two I need to run, before dinner. Naruto glanced at Jiraiya, but he was already halfway up the steps. Need me to come? No, I will be fine myself, just need to talk to a couple people. When do you think you'll be back? Not sure, but before dinner for sure. All right then, Naruto said, perhaps a little more carefully than he had before. Tenten followed the pair up, retrieving her blue dress coat and her pistols. Naruto exchanged a glance with Hinata before creating a clone. The clone quickly vanished in a shimmer of chakra and tailed Tenten out of the inn. Had it been Hinata he had been tailing, the camouflage technique would have never worked, but like him, Tenten did not have any extra sensory techniques in her repertoire. As long as he stayed to the roofs, there was little chance of Tenten discovering him. Jiraiya was waiting for the pair in Naruto's room. Where is Tenten? Went to run some errands, Naruto said. Whatever. You can catch her up when she gets back. That actually brings me to my first point. One of the main areas I will be instructing you in is sealing, very advanced stuff that is only known to about a dozen others in the world. That obviously includes your great demon binding seal. My what? The seal that the Kyubi is held in. I thought that was called the 8 trigrams seal. The 8 trigrams sealing style, yes. Combined with the dead demon consuming seal, it makes the great demon binding seal. The various Jinchuriki seals use different methods to bind the biju, from Sand's hidden oasis sacrifice possession, waterfalls crashing thunder seal and clouds iron armor seal, the great demon binding is unique. How so? Hanada asked, beating Naruto to the punch. For one, it only seals half of the biju's chakra in the Jinchuriki. Two, it constantly, deliberately leaks a small amount of the biju's into the Jinchuriki's circulatory system. This is unique because while all biju sealing methods leak chakra, the great demon binding seal does so intentionally, and that means that the flow 
can be turned off, in certain circumstances. Hold on, I asked you about that after the invasion, and you said that you wouldn't do it. No, you asked if I would seal away the Kyubi, forever. Its chakra can be halted however, but it is a complicated technique, and needs significant preparation to do so. Anyways, I seem to have gotten a little sidetracked. What I was going to say is that I will be teaching you about your seal, and right now the number of people who could replicate it is one. Me. Teaching your women the knowledge necessary to subdue you, should it ever become necessary would be a good thing. I suppose so, Naruto agreed. No supposition about it. Facts are facts. I am well over the average age for a shinobi. I am old. I am not as fast, or as strong as I once was. When I pass on, you will be the only one with complete knowledge of your seal. Having someone else who can shut you down, if the worst should ever come to pass is not just a good idea, it is a smart idea. Leaving you with the only one with the key to your seal, so to speak, just invites disaster. So here is what is going to happen. Your women will attend our sealing lessons, even though much of what I am going to be teaching will be over their heads. At the same time, you will begin teaching them the basics. Tenton and Hanada are smart girls, they should be able to pick it up fairly quickly, at least in the beginning. Another reason why I want you to teach them is that you can never truly master anything, be it taijutsu, ninjutsu, or anything else, without teaching it yourself. Teaching makes you go over the basics again, making sure that you have everything exactly right before you pass it on. I see. Jiraiya smirked. Not yet, but you will. Ooh, the first stop Tenton made was a certain shop in the White City. While firearms were virtually unheard of among ninja, most able to move faster than a bullet, guns were far more dominant among the rest of the world, where the average person couldn't move faster than sight. Nevertheless, firearms were heavily regulated, more so in the capital than other places. So it was not hard to find one of the two stores that sold guns and various accessories. Her conversation with the ever so helpful corporal had given her several ideas, and not all just about her rifles. Officers seemed to carry their sidearms, some model of revolver, in hip holsters, much like she did. However, she had seen a number of civilians carrying pistols in some sort of shoulder harness. She received several looks as the bell over the door rang, announcing her entrance into what would have been a weapons store in Konoha. Of course, as UMC was not a shinobi town, the selection was limited to various types of hunting knives and firearms. Tenton paused just inside the door, sweeping her gaze across the store and its patrons. Is there something I can help you with, Sergeant? The man standing behind the glass paned counter was not what most would expect out of the proprietor of a gun shop. Gangly was the word that came to mind when Tenton examined the owner. 5'10 or so, he looked to be maybe 120 pounds. His arms hung at his sides, slightly bowed skin drawn tightly enough over his wrists and hands that the bones stuck out in knobs. Blue veins bulged over the back of his hands, long fingers looking more appropriate on a pianist. Yes, actually, I believe you can. Drawing one of her larger pistols from the holster, she laid it and her rifle down on the counter. I am looking to. Upgrade. The owner glanced down at the guns. Yes, I would imagine so. Do you have anything particular in mind? Do you sell model, 73 repeating rifles and Moses Brothers self-defense engine frontier model Bs? A slight smile. Yes, I do. If you will give me just a moment. The proprietor gave a shallow bow and stepped into a rear room. He re-emerged just a minute later, carrying a rifle. He handed it to Tenton. She hefted the weapon, noting that it weighed a good bit less than the ones she was using. Snugging the butt tight against her shoulder, she peered down the barrel. It was lighter than her current rifles, and quite a bit shorter. Graduated rear sights, accurate to about 2,000 yards, uses 38 to 40 caliber ammunition. Lever action, 15 round tube mag. Tenton set the rifle down and accepted the pistol. Muzzle heavy, she noted. A bit, because of the long barrel. Uses 38 to 40 calories ammo as well, making them interchangeable with the rifles. Tenton nodded, and broke the gun. Five round cylinder mag. I can sell you speed loaders for it, if you want. I would. She took off her belt and slipped the pistol holster off. Holsters come with the gun. Would you like shoulder or hip rigs? Shoulder. Can I get one with two holsters, like one under each arm? Sure thing. Anything else I can help you with? What kind of customization do you do? Well, just the standard stuff, scoping, 
changing the caliber, trigger tuning, that kind of thing. What do you want done? Can you inlay a pair of electrum plates, here and here? She asked, describing the area of the frame where the hands held the rifle, and on the inside of the muzzle. The owner paused and considered her request. Electrum, that is that chakra metal stuff, right? Tenton nodded. How long you planning to be in town? Another week, at least. Give me two or three days, and I have it done. May take me some time to find someone who carries Electrum, but I can do it. Good. I want two of the 73s and Frontier Model Bs, each. Very well. I will send someone to let you know when they are ready. I am staying at the Flame of the West, up by the Black City. Yes, I know of it. Who should I ask for? Higurashi Tenten. Very well, Sergeant Higurashi. Tenten collected her equipment and left. Hoisting her rifle higher up on her shoulder, she set out to the Black City. It had been a while since she had gotten some real target practice in, and now was a good opportunity to rectify that. U Naruto had long past worried as the sun set behind the high walls of the city. Tenten had set out hours ago, and should have been back well before now. He supposed that she just could have gotten caught up in something, but he didn't know, and that had him worried. His shadow clone had somehow been discovered up on the roof's tailing Tenten rather quickly, and dispersed in the resulting tussle. He had noted that his shadow clones seemed to have judgment and self control issues, and this was one hell of a time for their belligerence to crop up. Had he been anywhere other than Urashima Military City, he would have blitzed the area with shadow clones until she turned up, but that was not allowed. Jiraiya had never said what the punishment for breaking cover, as it were, but swarming the city with 5,000 copies of himself was liable to cause some issues with the authorities. Benji the innkeeper sent several of his runner boys out to see if they couldn't find word of her. Jiraiya did the same, contacting his informants within the civilian and military police to see if anyone had reported any disturbances within the city. Tenton was no slouch when it came to close quarters combat, but at the same time, it was far from her strong suit. Given her ties to Naruto, it was possible that she had been kidnapped, but by Akatsuki or some other agency, at this point didn't matter. Unfortunately, had she been kidnapped, Akatsuki was the likeliest suspect, as Naruto had not had the time to make many enemies outside of Konoha. Such worrying proved to be unwarranted, however. You mean she is in here? Naruto asked several hours after dark had fallen. Yeah, but don't worry, it shouldn't be too difficult to get her out. Still, what is she doing here in the first place? Naruto does have a point, Hanada added, it isn't like her to do anything that would get her brought here. I am sure she has a good explanation for it, Jiraiya said. Neither Naruto or Hinata said anything as they waited in the lobby for Jiraiya to return with the third member of their team. Naruto enfolded Tenten in a hug when she passed through the glass paned double doors, looking a little more worn than she had when he had last seen her. She had a swollen lip and her hair was down. He waited until she pulled back before asking the question that was on everyone's minds. What in the world did you do to get thrown in jail? Not my fault. She protested immediately, it was that sergeant that started the whole damn thing. Naruto cocked an eyebrow. Bastard insulted my guns. Naruto nodded sagely, face carefully neutral as they walked out the jail, an arm thrown across Tenten's shoulders. And he so had it coming. I mean, he accused me of cheating. Well, we are ninja, Hanada pointed out. That doesn't mean that he can be crappy shot and then blame it on me. Okay, I think this needs some background. The desk sergeant said you got into a brawl with a squad of MPs, Jiraiya said. It wasn't like I knew they were MPs, Tenton muttered, crossing her arms under her. Why don't you start from the beginning? Naruto asked. Fine, she huffed. I was at a firing range in the Black City, doing some target practice, since I haven't really done any in a while, and this asshole basically picks a fight with me. He keeps running his mouth, so I challenge him to a shooting contest. I won, of course, but he says I cheated. So I hit him. Just like that, you hit him? Tenton blushed. Well, I got mad and said that just because he had brains the size of his balls didn't mean that everyone else did, and that everyone else was as shitty a shot as he was. Jiraiya whistled. I am gonna have to remember that one. That is pretty good. And then? Naruto asked, grinning. And then he said that he had better make sure I wasn't a guy pretending to be a girl, and groped me. That is when I hit him. Okay, now I want to hit him too. Tenton giggled. I don't think that would be a good idea. 
getting thrown in jail would hardly endear you to the daimyo. Naruto waved her off. You kidding? That bastard grabbed your boobs. I am the only one who is allowed to do that. That's right, she replied with a smirk. Naruto smirked back and tightened his arm around her shoulders, pulling her in for a kiss. Not in the street, Jiraiya said sternly. Wait until we get back to the inn before you start any monkey business. Pa. It isn't like there is anyone around. She just got out, you want to go back in with her for excessive PDA? Coming from you, that sounds more than a little odd. Hey, I always wait until I am behind closed doors before I break out the mojo. Says the self-proclaimed super pervert. Different matter entirely, Jiraiya stated airily. Right, Naruto stated flatly. How often do you see me making out in the street? Never, because the only female companionship you can get charges by the hour. The conversation continued in that vein during the trip back to the inn, neither Hinata nor Tenten interrupting the pair's banter. Although, for Hinata, who was on the opposite side of Jiraiya from Naruto, it was spent peeking around the large man at Naruto and Tenten, and thinking. The quartet arrived back at the inn in good time, and headed to their individual rooms, and bed, shortly after. Jiraiya disappeared into his room immediately, Tenten pausing just long enough for a clone to accompany her into hers. Naruto lingered outside Hinata's to give her a long kiss goodnight. Naruto let go of Hinata and moved ahead to his own room, but Hinata did not reciprocate. Don't go, she said quietly. Naruto stepped in close again and wrapped his arms around her again, are you sure? Hinata did not say anything back, instead grabbing his shirt with one hand, opening the door with the other and pulling him inside. Naruto closed the door behind him, and shucked his coat, leaving it on the floor beside Hinata's. He picked her up, her legs wrapping around his waist and carried her over to the bed. He dropped her on the mattress, following her down, never breaking lip lock. He wasn't so absorbed in the kiss, in the feel of her lips and the heat of her mouth that he missed Hinata take his hand and draw it up under her shirt. Are you sure? He asked again, through the kiss. I need my husband, now, she muttered back. Naruto paused though. Hinata, hold on. No, she muttered back, kissing his neck. Hinata, I said hold on, saying it more forcefully, pushing her back, what is wrong? What do you mean, what is wrong, I mean, what is wrong, this isn't like you. What isn't like me? She asked, suddenly sitting back and scowling, taking the initiative, wanting to spend the night together with my husband? I mean making a move so suddenly, why is it that you only want to sleep together now? Why don't you want to sleep with me? She shot back, I mean, you have been sharing a bed with Tenten for weeks now. Naruto did not say anything for several seconds taken back by the apparent anger in Hinata's voice. Is that what this is? I have been sleeping with Tenten but not you. Hinata said nothing, blushing a little. You know that she and I aren't sleeping sleeping together, right? And how would I know that? It isn't like you tell me what you two do together. Naruto wasn't quite sure what to say to that. I always thought that is how you wanted it. I mean, neither of you seemed particularly interested in what I did with the other. He paused. Do you want me to tell you what I do with Tenten? No, Hanada replied instantly. Well, then I am not sure what to say. What do you want from me? Naruto was honestly confused. Tenten and Hanada had always seemed perfectly content with how things were. He had never heard either of them complain about how he treated either of them. Please, Hanada chan tell me what is wrong so I can correct it. However, that seemed to be the exact wrong thing to say. And so he found himself standing out in the hall, after having gotten her door slammed in his face, his coat in one hand, utterly bewildered. What the hell? He wondered to himself. He heard a snickering, and looked down the hallway. Jiraiya was standing several feet away, with a two straight face, apparently with a case of the hiccups. Naruto stared at the old general for several seconds. Jiraiya couldn't help himself. It was just too damn funny. He burst out laughing, hunching over because he couldn't get his breath, forgetting to hold the glass cup behind his back. He shambled past Naruto, who made him laugh all the harder with the look on his face. Anko would bust a gut when she heard. Wondering just what the fuck had happened, Naruto decided it was too late to worry about it and headed to bed. Uneji was in a bad mood. Not that that would have been of much note a couple of months earlier, but the last couple of months had been sort of eventful. While he would never be described as bubbly, or cheerful, or outgoing, like his teammates, 
he was no longer the dour, unpersonable near recluse that he had been before. Guy, Lee and Eno had been willing to leave him be at first, guessing that he would be able to work through whatever had happened by himself, but after a third straight day of mostly monosyllabic conversations and an apparent unwillingness to talk to anyone, Team Guy, or more properly, Eno, decided to get to the bottom of what was bothering her teammate. Eno, I have neither the time nor inclination to deal with your curiosity. I am fine, and there is somewhere I need to be. If you will let me go, you can bug me about nothing later. Well, that's an improvement right there. That must have been the longest thing you have said in days. It has not, Neji denied. Oh, oh heading back toward monosyllabicity again. Fight it, Neji. Use your words. While Eno was often annoying, this was a whole new level of ridiculousness, even for her. As she had apparently just decided to irritate him, something that she was prone to doing on occasion, he just tried to walk around her. But she was not having it, simply matching his movements, even when he turned around. Eno, go bother Guy or Lee. I do not have time to deal with your idiocy today. Today, or the last couple of days either, it would seem. Just as he was going to jukin her into submission, Eno threw her hands together in the specialized hand seal for the mind body switch, and the next thing he knew, Eno was in his head. Eno, I swear, if you do not get out of my head, right this instant, I am going to juke in you so that you won't be able to walk for a week. Just a moment, I am looking around here, and she was. He could see various memories flash by his eyes, until Eno hit pay dirt. Neji ground his teeth as Eno examined the memory, a recent one, in detail. I see. She said after a few seconds, Eno, stop speaking now. Ah, don't worry. I am done anyways, and with that, Eno released the technique and Neji regained control of his body. Eno, Neji began to growl. You can't really blame him, you know. Naruto probably just did not think about you when he made plans to leave the village. Nor did he even inform me he was leaving either. I had to find out from Shikamaru of all people. I am his second. He could at least mention it to me when he is planning to leave the village for an extended period of time. Well, it isn't like he was born into one of the clans like us. He probably still isn't used to thinking in those kinds of terms. Naruto sama isn't a child. He cannot afford to just forget about things like that. He is the next head of the Hyugas. It is his responsibility to think about those things. Why don't you just send him a letter or something? If I knew where he was, I might. The Hokage is being close lipped about it. Shikamaru, too. Well, I suppose that presents a problem, Ino admitted. Let's go look for Shikamaru. I can probably get Naruto's location out of him. Neji was not given an opportunity to resist, and was nearly frog marched along Ino to find Shikamaru. Why would Shikamaru know where Naruto is? Naruto is apparently doing something big, and I overheard him and Naruto talking about contacting him. Interesting and it was. While Naruto rarely did anything small, the fact that the Hokage had apparently said Shikamaru as her and Naruto's go-between was a fact to remember. Shikamaru knew trouble when he saw it. And Ino was always trouble. Had been when they were kids, and in the academy, and still was now they were ninja. The Nara boy made a smart about face on sight of the blonde woman, but not quickly enough to escape her sight. He seriously considered running for it, but she was faster than he was and it was very difficult to hide from the Byakugan. Sending a quick prayer skyward, he turned to face the pair. Where is Naruto? Ino asked without preamble. Shikamaru's mouth was open to tell them he was on the way to see the Hokage, and snapped it shut. While the fact that Naruto was on an extended mission out of the village was no secret, anything more specific was classified on a need-to-know basis. I can't say, he said. Yeah, yeah, I know, his mission is probably classified but you can at least tell Neji where to find him. He needs to send a letter to Naruto. There are a number of matters that Naruto-sama left unfinished before he departed. I need to contact him regarding several of them, Neji said somewhat stiffly, after Ino elbowed him. Still sounds weird to hear anyone call Naruto Naruto-sama. Shikamaru held his hands up to ward off Neji's frosty stare. Sorry. Either of you talk to the Hokage about it? I really can't say without her permission. Come on, Shikamaru. And the fact that I don't know where he is either. You know, you could have said, I don't know, at first. Would you have believed me? Ino considered that. Probably not. Well there you go. Now, I gotta go. Alright, 
Next stop, Hokage's Tower. Ooh, no, really? No, you won't even contact him for us? Naruto is currently out of communication. He will contact the village when he can. Until then, he is on his own. Damn, Ino shrugged. Sorry Neji, I did what I could. You make it sound like I asked for you help. Well, you have to admit, you couldn't really have expected me to mind my own business when you were acting all mopey. Neji opened his mouth to retort, but thought better of it, and left. Drat. I hadn't expected him to just walk out. Tsunade cocked an eyebrow. You mean you were deliberately antagonizing him? Well, it is either that, or bowl haircuts and spandex. The other woman chuckled. I can't say that anything that keeps the number of green beasts down is strictly bad. My reasoning too. Now, I am going to see if I can't find him before he gets back to his place and bug him to buy me some pudding. Don't you have your own money? I do, but it is more fun to spend his. Besides, it isn't like he is short on it. Whatever, Tsunade said chuckling and waving a hand in dismissal. Just get out of here. More than a week passed in Urashima military city with surprising swiftness for the teenage soldiers. September passed into October, and soon it was the 10th. This particular date could not have come quickly enough for Naruto, but once it had arrived, he greeted it with great enthusiasm. He was not quivering in place, nor bounding with unrestrained energy, but he bore a grin that had to make his face ache. I don't suppose that I have to ask if you are ready to go? Jiraiya had poked his head into Naruto's room to see if he was ready and saw Naruto, fully dressed, boots polished to mirror brightness, the creases in his coat and pants sharp enough to cut. Even the worn leather baldric that his blade hung from had been rubbed with oil, until the working stood out in stark relief. Naruto gave Jiraiya a look that told him where he could put that and pushed his way past the old man and out into the hall after he grabbed his trench coat. Hanada, who was finally talking to him again, even if he still didn't know what he had done to make her mad in the first place, and Tenten were already waiting in the common room, blades at hips, and in Tenten's case, guns as well. Tenten wore her long-barreled Moses Brothers pistols on low-slung hip holsters. She had originally tried to carry them in a shoulder rig, but the barrels were so long that they did not fit well under her coat, and were awkward to draw besides. That meant that her sword had been moved to her back, a new sword belt slung from right shoulder to left hip. The two women wore their Uzumaki crested black trench coats as well, Tenten slitted just below the nape of her neck to allow her to wear her blade under her coat and the four ninja in disguise quickly left the inn. As they walked, Jiraiya spoke. Now, I know that I have already instructed you on how to behave in the daimyo's presence, but we will go over everything once more. When we arrive, we will only be one of any number of petitioners waiting to see the daimyo. It is unlikely that we will be seen to first, so we may have to wait for some time. When we are allowed to address the daimyo everyone will come forward, but Hanada and Tenten just a little behind Naruto and me. The daimyo is to be addressed as either sire, or my lord, at all times. Everyone will go to their knees when he enters, and only rise once he is seated. Once we have been called on to address the daimyo, I will introduce Naruto, and he will make his case. There is a chance that he will call on either Hinata or Tenten, and should he, make your replies brief and to the point. There will also be representatives of the Church of the Jaw, as well as the Kanushi. Naruto, summarize what I have told you about both groups. Well, the Acolytes, as church members are called, are a quasi-monotheistic religion that says that there is only one god, the Jaw, and they are his chosen people. Members wear black cassocks, with a white collar, and wear straight, cruciform swords. They say that their god once came down from heaven and took the form of a man, before he was killed, several thousand years before the beginning of the new era. They are still waiting for his prophesied return, which will come at the end of time. They were also the first to seal the biju away into inanimate objects, before we took their techniques and adapted them to create the jinchuriki. Their faith seems to give them some sort of power, a sort of resistance to the chakra of the biju, and have unnatural luck. They can charge a line of riflemen and manage to be in the exact right place at the exact right time so they come through unscathed. They join their priesthood as teenagers, and do not leave their conclaves for twenty years. Every single one is a swordmaster, and are not to interact with unless necessary. The Kanushi are the Shinto priests, the monks in the ninja samurai monk trivium. They are superficially similar to the acolytes, but bear some significant differences. 
They are closer to magicians than fighters, and can call the elements to their aid without the use of ninjutsu or hand seals. They were the originators of sealing, as ninja use it, and it is rumored that they can create seals with a single gesture, using nothing but pure chakra to do so. There have been attempts to infiltrate their monasteries before, but whoever is sent in, soon comes back out, with no memory of what had occurred within. The Kanushi are all older, as they recruit from the ranks of the samurai, and as they do, they are all skilled in swordplay, but spend most of their time studying whatever it is they study to do what they do. Both the acolytes and the Kanushi vie for influence with the daimyo and possess considerable political clout within the court. The current daimyo has favored the Kanushi for most of his reign, but he seems to be favoring the acolytes more of late. Good, Jiraiya said, and exactly right. The daimyo had been a steadfast supporter of the Kanushi for the last twenty years or so, and nobody knows exactly what the acolytes have done to gain his favor, and that makes a lot of people nervous. The acolytes are not well loved among much of the court, and the last thing we want is the acolytes to gain too much ground on the Kanushi. After a meditative pause, he added, they don't really like us ninja. Or rather, they don't trust us. Doesn't change anything though, Naruto stated. No, it doesn't, Jiraiya agreed. In any case, just try to stay clear of either group, though each has their own agenda toward which they will try to influence the daimyo. As long as you get permission to leave, you got what you came for. And don't be fooled. The daimyo may appear to be an airheaded, fickle bureaucrat, but he is not. It took another 10 minutes to get to the Black City, and another 20 beyond that to arrive in the throne room. It was not nearly as large as any of the teenagers were expecting, maybe 25 meters square. The Red Throne was on a dais, raised 5 feet above the floor, with a set of stairs in the back for the daimyo to ascend. The throne itself was not visible, hidden by a curtain. Directly behind the dais, was a narrow hallway, from which the daimyo would emerge to climb the dais. There were a number of other people there, perhaps two score or so, in perhaps a dozen groups. The daimyo had not arrived yet, of course, so that gave Naruto time to examine the architecture. Aside from the fact that everything was in the black volcanic rock that the mountain was made of, it greatly resembled pictures of the previous era's architecture that Naruto had seen, before the thousand year glows and death valleys. The room had a gabled roof, with stone pillars on each side of the room, connected by a broad stone beam everything carved and worked to imitate wood. Between the pillars were small trees, Sakura on the left, and Tachibana on the right. The petitioners were left waiting for approximately 30 minutes, before the double doors they had entered through slammed closed through no apparent mechanism. The sound barely had the chance to die out before two columns of people came around the dais, presumably from the hallway behind the throne. There were eight of them, what Naruto assumed to be the royal ministers and a man dressed in brilliant crimson and white and the blue and white of the Kanushi. They arranged themselves to either side of the dais, with the two religious men closest to the dais, in opposite columns. A minute after that, the daimyo himself arrived, the only sign of which was the shadow he cast on the curtain facing the petitioners, and the arrival of one last person. It was Wurjao, the blonde haired man that had dictated that they have to wait over a week to meet the daimyo. The blonde man carried a sheaf of papers, and little else. At some unseen signal, everyone went to their knees, and the blonde man's voice rang out over the chamber. On this tenth day of the tenth month, 1974 years into the new era, the 1932nd year in the reign of the emperor who was, I present Urashima Yamamoto, third of his name, lord of the land of fire, guardian of the empire, ever loyal servant of the emperor who was and the emperor to come. When the chamberlain fell silent, the curtain split in the middle, and the daimyo was seen. But, he was not seated in the throne placed in the center of the dais, instead, seated in a smaller, less ostentatious seat forward and to the right of the throne. The daimyo was a thin, fleshy man, with a large, hooked nose, strong chin and deep smile lines extending from his nose and curving around the ends of his mouth. His dark eyes and thin lips bore a small smile now and surveyed the petitioners with quick sweeps that missed nobody. His eyes flicked to the chamberlain and gave a small nod. The next four hours were an exercise in boredom for Naruto. He listened somewhat attentively to the first two or three petitioners, but quickly became unable to muster even a cursory interest in the proceedings. Given that the samurai were the dominant force in the country, he had expected a little more warrior and a little less aristocrat in his nominal lord. Urashima seemed to be almost as bored as he was, 
at times, participating very little in the overall adjudication, declaring the party that convinced him the most the winner. Oftentimes that meant that whoever made the last argument was the one that he decided in favor of. If Jiraiya's statement about the daimyo was true, he hid it well. It was nearly two o'clock before Naruto was called to address the daimyo. Jiraiya and Naruto walked side by side in lockstep, trailed and flanked by Hinata and Tenten. All four went to one knee and rose at the Chamberlain's signal. My lord, Jiraiya said, thank you for granting us an audience today. However, given the sensitive nature of subject of our request, I would ask that the chamber be cleared. The daimyo did nothing but flick his gaze to his seneschal, who then motioned for the guards to escort the other petitioners from the room. The chamber has been cleared, Jiraiya, where Zhao said in his mellifluous voice. Now is the time to present your case. Of course, my lord, but I would defer to my companion, Captain Hayuga Naruto, who is more directly involved with the subject of our request. Urashima nodded, and motioned for Naruto to step up. Naruto cleared his throat, and gave the speech that he had been practicing for several days. First of all, I would like to thank my lord for granting us an audience with your person, particularly given the gravity of what I wish to discuss. As I am sure you are aware, I am the, the Jinchuriki of the Kayubi no Yuko. As you are well aware, the balance of power between the nations of the world is often precarious, especially between the Jinchuriki holding nations, particularly given the recent San Sound invasion. Each Jinchuriki is the ace in the hole for his or her country, and a threat to anyone is a serious matter. The power of a Jinchuriki is such that it requires another Jinchuriki to counter. I say this not to patronize you, my lord, but to reinforce the seriousness of what I am about to say. My master, Jiraiya Sensei, has been tracking a group for some time now, calling itself Akatsuki, with the stated goal of abducting all nine Jinchuriki, for purposes that are not clear. However, the mere fact that they have set their sights on we Jinchuriki is cause enough for concern. The daimyo frowned, and the ministers and the guards all broke out in quiet murmurs. The daimyo leaned back in his chair, heavy lidded eyes drooping in either intense thought or sleep. But it was not Urashima that spoke, but rather the blonde haired Wurjao again. This is a serious allegation. How reliable is your source, Jiraiya? Rock solid, my lord. My agent is as placed in such a position that he could not be wrong. I see. Captain Hayuga, you say that the Jinchuriki are the aces in the hole for each nation, and you are correct. But by that same logic, the Jinchuriki are among the most protected individuals in the world. What makes you think that this group, this Akatsuki, has the strength, and the reach, to kidnap all nine? And what about its size? Any group hoping to attack the source of the elemental nation's strength would have to be formidable in size large enough, at least, to have come to our attention before now. Not necessarily, my lord. According to Jiraiya Sensei's informant, there are only nine members of Akatsuki, and all the members we know of are S-rank shinobi. Again, Naruto's words caused their audience to break out in murmurs, but not all were content to whisper among themselves. One of the ministers, clutching a medium-thick folder bearing a sword and flame seal stepped forward. General Kyushu, other than your single informant, do you have any evidence to lend credence to your claim? Given the nature of Akatsuki and its members, I believe anything further would be stretching the bounds of reason. And can you list the members of this organization? If your informant is as well placed as you say he is, then you should at least be able to tell us why we should believe that this group can do what you say they can do. Zetsu, the ghost. Sasori, of the Red Sands. The Mad Bomber, Didera. Kakuzu, of Five Souls. Hidan, the immortal. The monster of the hidden mist, Kisame. Itachi clan killer. And the head of Akatsuki, who is merely called the leader. You are saying that seven known S rank missing nin have banded together? The minister was pale faced, but was probably one of the more composed members of the court present. Several of the other ministers had bloodless faces, and even the daimyo seemed to be paying attention. You have to be mistaken. There would be news if that many S rank missing nin. It would be war, the daimyo said quietly, all pretense to idiocy or airheadedness abandoned in his gaze. It wouldn't be a fourth shinobi war, it would be a hot war, one we have not seen in a hundred years or more. And if Jiraiya is telling the truth, should this group get all nine biju, it would be a fourth world war, with violence and death to compete with the one that ended the previous era. He paused, 
apparently cutting himself off before he said too much. Jiraiya, why did you not bring this information to me sooner? To be frank, my lord, because there is nothing you could do. As of now, you know everything I do about the group. I do not know of their recruiting procedures, what, if any support they have, finances, materiel, etc. The daimyo frowned. You said that you had an informant within the group. What of him? Communication with my man is limited. The leader, whoever he is, is extremely paranoid, and not without reason. He keep the members of his organization on short leashes and in the dark about his eventual goals. Keep in mind, the ghost numbers among their members as well. The daimyo looked to his seneschal. I have nothing to corroborate or refute the general's claims, sire. But, if I may, at this point, it does not matter over much whether or not Kyushu Dono and Hyuga Dono are correct in their claims. The fact that even the possibility of such an alliance between such highly skilled criminals is great enough that any rumor of such must be investigated thoroughly. So noted, Urashima said calmly, As for your request, I have yet to hear it. Nodding to Naruto, Jiraiya stepped back and let the youth address the daimyo again. I wish to leave the fire country for the purpose of recruiting the other Jinchuriki into an organization to counter Akatsuki. Ridiculous, one of the heretofore silent members of the court interjected. As Jiraiya had warned, what was likely the acolyte's representative had been the first to object, quickly echoed by his opposite in blue. Your objective is understandable, but if Jiraiya Dono is to be believed, you cannot be allowed to leave the country. Uniting the other Jinchuriki would be an achievement on any number of levels, but venturing beyond our borders, especially to lightning and rock would place you at intolerable risk. My counterpart, the Archbishop, is correct. The blue-robed man looked to be fighting his distaste in agreeing with the acolyte, but agreed. If we were lightning or mist or rock, the possible loss of a Jinchuriki could be lessened, but the loss of our sole Jinchuriki would be an unmitigated disaster. Risks cannot be avoided entirely but they can be minimized, and this is a completely unnecessary one. Emissaries can be sent, acting in proxy to at least inform the other villages of the threat. Naruto hesitated, hoping that the daimyo might intercede for him, but he merely leaned back, letting Naruto fend for himself. Drawing from his arguments with Tsunade, he said, Akatsuki is a threat not to just us Jinchuriki, but to everyone. Only an organization of Jinchuriki, one counter to Akatsuki, could have the ability to fight them on an even playing field. Of course, the fact that both sides would be trying to make said field as uneven as possible went without saying, but the point stood. The more Jinchuriki Akatsuki gets its hands on, the harder it will be to stop them. Even one or two could be enough to tip the scale irreversibly in their favor. And to be frank, it would be impossible to expect any organization to function working solely through proxies. And that is assuming that my fellow Jinchuriki would even agree to meet on the word of a non Jinchuriki. My traveling to Lightning and Rock is a risk, a large one, but one that must be made. The fact that I am willing to come to Lightning and Rock in person alone should be enough to get an audience at the very least. Naruto paused for a moment, gathering his thoughts. Basically, what I am trying to say is that we need to be able to trust each other, and if I do not go in person, that says that I do not trust, and it has failed before it has begun. Such eloquence from one so young, Urashima said airily, and a compelling argument, but it does not change the fact that you are our only Jinchuriki, and were you to be killed or captured, by Akatsuki or another village, your loss would be a serious blow against Konoha's strength. Everything you say is true, my lord, but I argue what will keeping me safe matter if the rest have all been killed or captured. Jiraiya said we don't know exactly what Akatsuki wants with the biju, but it has to be for some type of weapon. The Kyubi is the greatest of the Biju, but even it cannot stand against the lesser aid combined. Simply put, I am the only one who has a chance of defeating Akatsuki before they begin. Very well. You say you are the only one who can defeat Akatsuki? That may very well be true. At the same time, your kill or capture is something that must be considered as well. Therefore, I have a test for you. Urashima stood up, and took a step off the dais, taking the five-foot drop in stride. I see you carry a blade at your side. I assume you know how to use it. I do, my lord. Should you defeat me by blade, I will let you leave. Should I win, you shall remain within the country. Urashima untied the obi of his kimono and let the expensive garment fall to the floor of the chamber. Underneath, he proved that he was not all bureaucrat, narrow shoulders and chest wrapped in tough-looking, ropey muscle. 
his skin drooped somewhat loosely, evidence of a far more muscular build in his youth. The hilt of a katana was laid in his open palm by the seneschal, and Urashima wrapped his fingers and swung the sword in a series of absent minded circles and rolls, useless in a fight, but showing casual familiarity with the blade and plenty of manual dexterity. Is that acceptable to you? Be careful, Jiraiya whispered into his ear. Urashima is not the best swordsman around, but he is better than most. Do not let him succor you. Naruto said nothing as the onlookers drew back, ministers and his team alike, some of the daimyo's retainers looking distinctly uneasy. He handed his baldric and scabbard off to Tenten, holding Kitsune loosely at his side. The daimyo offered him a shallow bow, which Naruto mirrored. There was no referee to declare the start of the match, so the pair simply stood, relaxed, neither making a move. Naruto did not bother testing his opposite's footwork, and simply went on the attack. Urashima's longer blade interposed itself between Naruto and the daimyo with scarcely a flicker of movement. The attack had been a straight overhead cut, with a horizontal block. Naruto dragged his gladius along the length of Urashima's katana, and drew his sword in close as he spun around in a low cut aimed at the daimyo's kidneys. Again, Urashima blocked the blow, but not as effortlessly as he had the first time. A downward stab at his leg or foot was deflected to the side, as was a horizontal slash across his abdomen. Naruto was fast, one of the fastest ninja in Konoha, but Urashima was just as fast, and bigger and stronger besides. Urashima dodged Naruto's slash and stepped back. Naruto attacked again with a right to left diagonal cut that was blocked, turned it into a snaking thrust that Urashima danced away from, followed up with several high cuts designed to draw Urashima's guard high, and then dropped low with a thrust that would have hamstrung the older man, had it hit. Another half dozen missed or blocked attacks, and Naruto withdrew. Naruto was a strong fighter, but an average swordsman, and barring ninjutsu and taijutsu, he did not think he could beat Urashima. So sheathing his sword, he rolled the dice. He was a ninja, no matter what the unwritten rules said, and he thought that as long as he limited his ninjutsu, the chances of protest were acceptable. Hands forming the seal to his signature technique, there was a dull thoom, and thirteen Naruto's rose from the smoke. Some of the peanut gallery muttered at the display of ninjutsu, but nobody interfered. Urashima took a fighting stance for the first time, in a high guard, his blade held above his head and gave a full body flex a burst of chakra bursting forth, churning chaotically around the samurai before calming down and settling into a stable chakra bubble, Urashima at the center. Naruto blinked at the odd stance, and gave a mental shrug at the chakra cloak. If he was going to use ninjutsu, he supposed the chakra cloak was fair game as well. However, it was clear that Urashima used the high guard for a reason, the downward circular sweep of his blade batting aside three attacks, sliding into a long thrust catching a clone in the guts that was coming in from an oblique angle. In fact, Urashima's entire style seemed to shift. Instead of stepping from block to strike, he seemed to flow, instead of stopping attacks with hard blocks, Urashima deflected his cuts and thrusts, sometimes avoiding attacks entirely. Several clones were de-sorted and de-armed by a deceptive little snaking thrust that Naruto could not keep track of. More than one lost his head to a weird looping cut that seemed to vanish and strike from nearly the opposite direction mid-strike. Naruto kept refreshing his clones, but Urashima seemed to be able to just barely keep ahead of him. It wasn't without cost to the daimyo, though. Naruto had yet to actually draw blood, but Urashima was sweating and the effort was starting to show. Three clones came at him at once, all three thrusting at once. Urashima danced away from the first two and swatted the third sword out of his hands and drove his blade into three's chest to the hilt. Reversing his sword, a fourth clone was dispelled, turning the thrust into a wide sweeping slash that was stopped cold by a pair of steel bracers. Urashima took a quick step and hooked a foot around the back of the Naruto clones and appended him, the ice pick gripped short blade coming within an inch of his face. He was unable to take advantage of the appended clone when two more clones launched a third into the air. Urashima avoided the aerial attack easily enough, taking a single step back, enough to take him out of the range of the aerial clone's blade, and almost got upended himself when the launched clone immediately dropped into a foot sweep, keeping him on the defensive as the two that had launched the third hopped over him, each swinging their swords in vertical downward strokes. He blocked both cuts with a horizontal block, 
letting the tip of his katana fall forcing his opponent's blades out of position as he slipped the other way, and then bisected one of the clones with a sliding slash. The daimyo was good, very good, Naruto came to realize, he wasn't head and shoulders above Naruto in skill, but he was skilled enough that defeating him purely with bladework was an extremely iffy proposition. Urashima did not seem to have an issue with him using shadow clones to assist him, but were he to break out his full ninja arsenal, he doubted that he would stand for that. At the beginning of the fight, Naruto knew that he would have to outthink the daimyo if he was as good as Jiraiya said, which he was and more. Naruto had taken advantage of the large cloud of billowing smoke his clones created to wrap himself in the camouflage technique, removing himself from the immediate fight, and giving him the ability to analyze Urashima's abilities without distraction. Letting his clones die, he dropped the invisibility jutsu as the last of the smoke dissipated. Giving up? Urashima asked. Not yet, I still have one ace up my sleeve. Drawing Kitsune, he vocalized its activation phrase. Deaden, deafen, blind. Flash, Kitsune. The words tumbled out of his mouth, sounding before he knew what he was saying. It was the first time that Naruto had actually used his Zanpakuto's release command and it caught Naruto almost as off guard as it did Urashima. Normally, his Zanpakuto just sort of shimmered and flowed into its silver katana form, but this time, it released a burst of light, a rainbow corona emanating from the blade for a split second. He was on Urashima in a blink of an eye, trying to batter through the reeling daimyo's defenses, to no avail. Despite being nearly blinded by looking directly into the shifting sword, Urashima managed to keep his skin whole, relying almost entirely on instinct and training as he blinked to clear the purple and gold afterimage from his sight. But just as his sight returned to him completely, he swung his blade in a one-handed, straight overhead slash, the attack defeated by a horizontal block. He only had time to catch a glimpse of his distorted reflection in Naruto's silver blade when everything slewed to the right, nearly throwing him to the ground. He tried to regain his balance, but it was a precarious thing the ground wobbling beneath him as if it were balanced on a ball. The members of his court looked on in frozen fascination. No, that wasn't right. They were too still, too. Flat, as if someone had replaced the people with cardboard cutouts. The walls looked pretty normal, except that they were kind of hazy, as if he were looking at them through fogged glass. All this flashed through his mind in a split second, as his attention returned to Naruto. Genjutsu, he thought. He caught me with some kind of genjutsu, but he is not supposed to be able to use it. The thoughts passed sluggishly through his mind as he tried to focus on his opponent, but it was very difficult. Naruto was obscured by the same hazy indistinctness that the walls were, the only distinct thing about his was the vaguely fox-shaped shadow that loomed over him. He backpedaled as fast as he could, barely staying on his feet, barely keeping ahead of that brilliantly silver sword. He blinked, an action that seemed to take a dozen times too long, and the hazy Naruto figure vanished. He began to turn, pushing through air that felt like pudding, stumbling and barely catching himself in split second before the silver katana would have buried itself in his throat. Time seemed to lurch back into motion, but the onlookers remained frozen stunned disbelief. The next thing that Naruto heard was the scrape and swish of the royal guard's polearms being brought to bear on him and the rapid drumming of aforementioned guard's boots carrying them towards Naruto. He backed off, sheathing his sword carefully and keeping his hands well in sight. Urashima waved his guards off, reluctantly obeyed. I suppose that expecting you to follow the rules to the letter would be stupid. I was told that you can't use genjutsu. I don't, it is sort of a special ability I have, and it isn't like that I would limit myself to sword work in a real fight in any case. Be that as it may you did break the rules, on the other hand, you did defeat me. So you will uphold your side of the bargain? I will. We're Zhao, start getting the documents drawn up. As the blonde-haired man bowed and turned to speak to another man, the red-robed acolyte spoke up again. My lord, I feel I must protest this entire sequence of events. Captain Hyuga is a military asset of incalculable value. If you must allow this, then I must insist that the acolytes be allowed to send a representative along with him. With respect to General Kyushu, the acolytes are uniquely suited to dealing with Jinchuriki, and would be able to prevent Captain Hyuga to be able to be used against us. What is that supposed to mean? Tenton asked suddenly, stepping forward. Jiraiya grabbed her shoulder, pulling her back, but she jerked her shoulder out of his grip. I am sorry, 
But who are you? Higurashi Tenten. What did you mean by preventing Naruto kun to be used against us? The Archbishop shot a sharp glance to Jiraiya, who pulled Tenten back, the girl reluctantly subsiding. No, hold on. I want to know what he meant by that also, Hanada said. My name is Hayuga Hanada, heiress to the Hayuga clan. I will demand an answer from you if I must. Hayuga Dono, this is not the appropriate time to be making such inquiries. Hanada Chan, he is right. Whatever he means, we can get an explanation later. Let's just get this done with for now. I don't like it, Naruto kun, Hanada said, folding her arms over her chest. Me too, Tenten added. Whatever he can do, it sounds like it is powerful, and I just do not like the idea of having a minder sent with us. Hanada Chan, Tenten Chan, don't worry about it now. We can figure out just what to do later. Later. The two women subsided at Naruto's look. The acolytes are not the only ones who will be participating in this mission either. In addition, I will be sending a detachment of soldiers along with you, Captain. Second Legion, 5th Regiment? The Sword and Flame Minister said. Bad company? Urashima asked. I will notify the commander. Do so. Turning to Naruto, he spoke to him again. Return tomorrow to collect your papers and escorts. They will be given orders you safeguard your life above all. Other than that, they will be under your command, Captain. I cannot be coddled. I will have to visit Lightning and Rock at some point, and as long not prevent me from doing what I need to. You will not be not be kept from entering Lightning and Rock, but if you do place yourself in needless danger, you will be prevented from doing so. Very well, Naruto said grudgingly. Return here tomorrow to meet your escorts and receive your papers. Ooh, it took Team Shinigami most of an hour to leave the Black City, and by then, all three teens were grateful to be out from under the oppressive weight of the final redoubt. That was not nearly as hard as I was expecting, Naruto said cheerily. You got that right. Even I am surprised that the daimyo let you go so quickly. I was anticipating much more resistance from more of the ministers than they gave. So we should probably head to Iron first. You said that you know the guy in charge? Mafune, the governor general, yes. He is not particularly fond of shinobi like all samurai, but he not as rabidly anti-ninja as some others are. I don't think that we should have much trouble convincing him to lend his support, as he is usually for international peace and cooperation and all that jazz. Creating a group of such disparate individuals would be a huge coup, in his eyes, so I see no reason why he would be opposed to helping us. Excellent. After that I think we should head to sand, and then to water, to meet with Gara and Sora. I am pretty sure that Gara would be willing to join but I don't know so much about Sora. I have talked to her about other stuff, but never anything like this. Sounds like a good enough plan for now, Jiraiya said. The real challenge will come when it is time to convince the Lightning and Earth Jinchuriki to join, and finding the two exiled Jinchuriki. Exiled Jinchuriki? Tenten asked. That seems kind of risky, allowing a Jinchuriki to defect from its village. I doubt that Mist or Rock was given much of a choice. Other than Naruto, all Jinchuriki are trained from birth to be among the best shinobi of their village. Combine that with the raw power of the biju itself, there is often very little a village can do if one decides to go rogue. As the cage ship of the ninja villages tends to be dynastic, Jinchuriki are almost always chosen from close relatives of the reigning cage, often from immediate family members. For example, Gara is the son of the previous Kei's cage and the current host of the Eight Tales is the current Reikage's brother. I would think that they would have some sort of way to make sure that they didn't go rogue though, Tenten said again. Not so much. It takes a long time to train a ninja, Jinchuriki or not, and a certain level of trust is required. After all, Jinchuriki are weapons, and if you cannot trust your most powerful weapon not to betray you, then it is worse than useless. That is why indoctrination is the favored method of controlling Jinchuriki. Still, what if one does get out of control? Then you either choose to fight, knowing that you are going to lose a lot of people, or let it go Hanada-chan. Mind control and chakra suppression and other kinds of safeguards have been tried before, but no one has found an effective method of applying them. Just sealing a biju is dangerous and delicate enough, without complicating it. Still, I think that someone would have found a way to do something after all this time. That kind of thing is a lot harder than you would think. I would think that you would have enough experience with that kind of thing to know better, Hanada-chan. 
even delicately used, it tends to do more harm than good, long term.